Hey, everybody, and welcome to a special episode. It's our square one episode of Knocked Conscious. We have two very special guests with us. But before we introduce them, I'm very excited because I want to hear the true stories of everything. Uh, but before we introduce them, I wanted to share something I said uh, a couple months ago. It was after watching Leaving Neverland. And uh, obviously, Square One's getting a lot of buzz on Twitter, uh, debunking a lot of what Leaving Neverland was. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play that clip first, and then I'm going to talk about how I got to watch Square One and then my change of heart through a Facebook post, and then we'll introduce our special guests. So here's the recording of the uh, Facebook, or not the Facebook, but the podcast that I did. It was in the Catholic Church uh, interview, but here is what I said. Late last year, I watched an HBO special called Leaving Neverland. Yeah, I saw it too. Had similar content. It was two episodes. It was like two episodes. They were long, though. I think I watched them one and four one hours per total. day. So I think I watched one and watched the other. Um, I was with my girlfriend. And uh, I was impotent. Shut up. I could not perform... No I way. couldn't perform for a couple days. No joke. I, I, I looked at her. I'm like, I am so disgusted. It just all felt dirty. Dude. Like, I know it sounds fucked up, but. It no, all felt, that's, but that's. It all felt dirty. So, oh, my God, dude. Um, let me just say, since then, it's my choice. This is why. This is why I don't understand. You can get out. You have choice. You the one you're in fucking America. The one two things you have are speech and choice, at least and guns. <laughs> but look, you have fucking choice. I have not listened to an adult Michael Jackson song since that since that documentary. All right. So that's what my feeling was about how I felt about things uh, in this topic uh, after watching Leave in Neverland. And it was pretty nasty. So I'd like to introduce our first guest. Her name is Jess Garcia. Jess, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Hi. 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 How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? We're doing awesome. Thank Welcome. you so much for coming on here. And it is absolutely because of you that we're even sitting here because you and I connected somehow on Twitter. Yes. How, how did this happen? You found me somehow, and I had 30 followers at the time. So I don't know how you even found me. I'm a podcast nerd, and so I was following podcasts, and uh, you guys, uh, you DM'd me and asked me to check out an episode. I was like, okay, cool. We'll check out this documentary called Square One on Amazon Prime. We'll do a trade. These clear about the same length and time, and uh, I guess that's how it happened. That's ex that's exactly how I remember it. It's it's funny you followed me and I wanted to thank you for following and I we like I said we did one on you know this is a very personal topic for me as well and um this was just a really close topic and I had asked you to watch that on the Catholic Church and you had asked me to watch Square One and I thought Square One without reading anything about it I thought it was going to be like Leaving Neverland 2.0 I thought it was just going to be a pile on so I'm really glad that you had encouraged me to do it so I read I watched the documentary and I'm going to read my Facebook post, and then we're going to introduce our second special guest. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about the documentary, and, and we'll have some questions. Great. So on Facebook, uh, right after watching Square One, it was really late at night, I wrote, Right or wrong, I'm a person who has an opinion about almost every subject. Because I am so bold in my stances, it's vital that I continually question my own thoughts, opinions, and ideas. After watching Leaving Neverland, which is an emotionally driven story, on HBO, I felt that there was little reasonable doubt about Michael Jackson's guilt. My response said I stopped listening to any adult Michael Jackson songs. I listened to the music he created when he was a child as I felt he was victimized in his youth. As an adult, he had the ability to choose whether he'd hurt someone or not, so I decided that I would not support any of his adult accomplishments. Last night, someone had uh, asked me to watch Square One on Amazon Video. I saw it advertised but was not interested in hearing any more about MJ, mainly because I'm physically disgusted by child abuse. After watching Square One, it is my updated opinion that if I were on the criminal jury regarding MJ, I would have absolute reasonable doubt of his guilt and would therefore declare him not guilty of any alleged charges. That said, I have resumed my appreciation for adult MJ songs. Admittedly, it was challenging to avoid any of his music in the first place as I admired his music so much. 
I even bought the microphones that he used to record Thriller to use on my podcast. Not his actual mic, but the ones based off of his. Uh, <laughs> off of his. I, do I do leave myself open to changing my mind again if faced with compelling evidence to the contrary. But in my mind, the defense team of MJ has provided reasonable doubt in my mind regarding a criminal verdict. In addition, the criminal jury... There was only one criminal case, found him not guilty on all 14 counts. I write this as proof that we have the responsibility to question ourselves as much as we question each other. Perhaps we can bridge more gaps with introspection rather than attacks on others. I sure learned a lot this week. So there's my Facebook post. I'm going to shut up now because I talk too much. But um, Jess, thank you so much for bringing this to me. And now I'd like to introduce our, our other special guest, um, Taj. Yes. Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> um, I'm Taz Jackson. I'm uh, the son of Tito Jackson and the nephew of Michael Jackson. And I'm honored to be on this podcast. Well, thank you so much You're for welcome. coming. Yeah. Thanks we're for so great. To, we're so great to have you. And, and it was very interesting because our conversation with Jess escalated when I was speaking with her. And, and she, she was so passionate about this that I wanted to just ask, hey, do you want to come on the show? And I, I didn't even know. She was very excited to do it, and she reached out to you without without us knowing. So we're excited to have you. Yeah, I said like I just wanted maybe someone else who might know a little bit more about it. And he goes, "Yeah, just get your associate or whatever." And then I was like, "It's Taj." Like, oh my god, it's Taj! <laughs> it's Taj. Yeah, yeah. I I'll be honest. I mean, the thing is, you know, I, don't get me wrong. I'm a Michael Jackson fan, but what's more important here yeah. is justice. <laughs> yes, hundred percent. Right? So my focus on this part is about this particular instance and clearing, clearing, you know, his, uh, Michael's name mm -hmm. as best as you can and everything. Yeah. So, so either of you would like to start on how, how did you get involved with Danny Wu or how did the whole process to the, to the, to the documentary start? Well, I can start with myself first since I kind of um, became quote unquote, the spokesperson, which I, um, of everything, which if anyone knew me beforehand, if you would have picked, you know, probably the, one of the shyest members of the family, of the Jackson family, I'd probably be on the top of the list, me and Brandy Jackson, who also did her rounds and, you know, talked and stuff like that. And it was just, as you said, I, I, I hate injustice. And it was something that having spent thousands and thousands of hours with my uncle, ever since I was from a baby, him holding me to probably the last, you know, three months before he passed, I was always close to him. And as someone that had been sexually abused on my mom's side of the family from an uncle, I see things differently. I see, I see things through the lens of a sexual abuse victim. And I also see when, you know, things don't add up as well. So I, I felt like, yes, I, you know, people can claim I'm biased because I'm a family member, but at the same time, if I thought that my uncle was even a point, point, point zero percent chance of him being, you know, guilty of it, I wouldn't be supporting him. I wouldn't waste my time. I would be quiet, you know, and, and that was one of the things, but I ended up, you know, going into the lion's den because I started in the U S you know, doing interviews, whoever would listen basically, because it was literally, literally felt like an assassination attempt on his, on his lead, um, his, I guess his legacy basically. And we, we never even knew that Leaving Neverland was coming out. They never even approached us. They never gave us the chance to um, combat it in a way. It was like, okay, it got rushed into Sundance. Here it is. And in the audience was all these um, journalists and sexual abuse survivors. So it was, it, the deck was stacked against us from the beginning. And all that time I was like, can I at least, can the family see it so we know what we're dealing with? You know, who are the, because at that time we didn't know who the two quote unquote accusers were. And um, I in my gut knew that one of them was Wade, but they weren't saying anything at that point. And then once I heard that one of them was Wade, I knew, okay, I know what this is now. Um, but um, Leaving Neverland was designed pretty much to be, I, you know, just like horror movies, um, you know, there's something called torture porn in horror movies, like so, those kind of movies like Saw and the ones like, that Eli yeah. Roth does. And, those, and they're designed to really make you feel this nasty emotion, this like gut wrenching emotion. And um, that's what to me what Leaving Neverland was, especially the wording that they used in terms of how they describe stuff. You, you know, if you don't know Michael Jackson or if you don't, you know, weren't associated with him, 
that's the reaction you're supposed to have because you're hearing these people talk about the disgusting act and you're of course you want to take a shower after and you're you know you 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 know or you can't perform you know in that way because it's like it it really affects you mentally in that way but that was what it was designed to do and you know it was very heavily organized that way almost like an onslaught but once you actually take a step back and actually listen to what they're saying you see that they contradict themselves from their own depositions under court and they also they their stories change over time and not change in a in a way that oh memories you know naturally will evolve no they change in terms of circumstance and when it benefits them and so we'll talk more about that later but i just became someone that was thrust into the spotlight you know having had a music career with 3t and you know, in that I was always like the George Harrison of the group. I was never the one that wanted <laughs> never. I always said my brother. Did you go to like, India? <laughs> you know, that's one. I mean, my name's Taj, but that's one, of the, <laughs> one of the places I've always wanted to, to go. And, and, but I always, I never liked the spotlight completely on me. I always like, okay, that's for my brothers, you know, let them have it. I'll just be in the background and, and that's fine. But with this, it just, it irritated me so much, especially since I knew Wade. I was friends with Wade. I helped Wade get into the memorial, um, my, my uncle's memorial. I helped, you know, Wade get to see the kids afterwards and all that stuff. So I felt really not only betrayed, like kind of um, like an idiot in a way and it like duped. And then once I started finding out why he was doing that and the, and the, um, sequence of events which we'll go over to over as well it's just like it really became apparently clear that this guy was just he was like a disgruntled worker that wanted to just get revenge on you know on i don't even want to say my uncle because in his mind he's probably thinking michael's dead so it's not affecting him you know i'm just going after the money um but it was just yeah so that's how i kind of you know i went to the uk kind of um had to, and I don't like to use the word defend my uncle. I stood up for my uncle because he's no longer here. He's not here to defend himself. Um, right. Yeah, and- it's tough because, I mean, the instantaneous defensiveness, it's going to come through because being a family member makes yeah. it challenging. It makes it challenging in that way. And people are like, you know, people always question, oh, well, that they're supposed to do that. They're family. You know, they have investment in it. And it's like, no, I'm doing what is right. And what, I, you know, if you know someone, just like if it was someone else's family member, if it was your family member and you knew that they weren't, they weren't capable of that or they did not do that and you have evidence of it and, and facts of it, you would support it too. You would be like, I'm going to scream as loud as I can, to, you know, to, to right this wrong. But the media basically, which is why I'm so appreciative when I'm, when I go on any kind of podcast or any kind of YouTube um, uh, kind of thing, or just a, a, a national network is just them hearing my story, hearing, hearing who my uncle truly was or why leaving Neverland, you know, is the lie that it is. And, and because we were shut out, we literally were shut out for a good portion of it, of a lot of the mainstream media would not pick up the story or the falsehoods of leaving Neverland because of the timing of the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement. It was, you can't question victims. You know? Right. It, well, it, that too, plus they double down, right? We're, oh, I mean, yeah. I, you and I are a year apart. Uh, Chris mm-hmm. is about two, two years older than I am. So we're within a three-year range of each other. Okay. And um, I was an adult 2021 20, when the trials were going on. So I'm very familiar with how, or the information that was fed us, right? Oh, yeah. And the one thing about this was really frustrating to me is, you know, you've got the, you know, NBC, ABC, CBS, all these big affiliates, you know, just burying your, your uncle. Yes. And now square one is getting such attention outside of the mainstream media. They're going to come back to you and we need not to give them that satisfaction of, of cashing in on both ends of it. You yes. know, they're, they're going to, they, they vilified them and now they're going to, you know, there's going to be a point here because square one is taking off like crazy, which it should, uh, yes. it should. And with Michael's birthday upcoming, I mean, it's going to get this global attention again. Yes. Um, and it's, and it should, because it, it, you know, it was done extremely well. And I always joke about it. It was not only fact checked by, you know, people that were critical of it, but it was fact checked by the fans. Like the fans don't want misinformation out there. You know, because it gives us a bad name at the same time. And so it, you know, it was double, it was doubly 
I don't want to say criticize. It was doubly, you know, we were doubly critical about it. Absolutely. That, yeah. yeah. And, and be, and like you said, I'm sorry for whatever you went through with your sexual abuse, but as from victim of sexual abuse, sometimes we want to go on a witch hunt, right? Yeah. So, so when you have a victim of sexual abuse coming and saying, I don't see this as what I experienced that holds even more, you know, it's got more teeth to it. It actually holds more water. And that's why I felt I had to be the one out of everyone in the family because I have I was in a unique situation in that way where they can use the words, oh, well, you don't know what it's like. No, I do know what it's like. And I, it was someone on, on my mom's side of the family who did this to me. And so I know what true victims go through. And that's why I was sympathetic. That's why I... If, if you noticed, and I mean, people can go back to my old tweets. I never attacked, um, you know, uh, Me Too or Time's Up. I always just said, hey, can we talk or can you listen to my side of the story? Because I didn't want to sabotage true victims and what they're going through because it does take courage to come out and say something. But at the same time, I've lived this life, you know, for 40 something years of my uncle being a target and I'm not only just saying with, you know, with fake allegations for child molestation, but, you know, we're talking paternity, you know, fake paternity um, cases, you know, where people would say that they were married to him or people said, Oh, he stole my song. I mean, he was constantly getting, you know, in court for things that I grew up watching and going, okay, you know, there's a lady named Billie Jean who claims that she was married to him or blah, blah, blah. Or this person says they're Michael Jackson's kid. So it's not in our world. It's not anything uncommon, you know, but to other people, it's like, oh, well, allegations don't, you know, fake allegations don't really exist. Well, they exist in my world plenty. You know? I can only imagine when you're, I mean, your, your uncle was the king of pop. Where, yeah. where else do you go from yeah. there? I mean, yeah. you're, you're the top mountain. Everybody's going to try to take a piece, right? Well, well, you look at it, every famous person in the world and, and they have fake allegations, you know, in some way. And, and one side, if it's political, you know, will lean towards that. The other side will try and defend that. And so it's just, it's just how it is because you're an easy target. I agree 100%. So I definitely want to get into square one. Taj, are we okay if we uh, uh, talk with Jess about? Oh, yes. You know, too. Jess, do me a favor. Yes. Could you, you're in the credits of square one in multiple places. Can you give us your credentials, your connection with Danny and how you like, what's your backstory and how you got into this? Well, um, I am a true crime nerd. I kind of mentioned podcasts earlier and uh, I uh, just growing up, I had always assumed that Michael Jackson had did something, but I never wanted to look into it. Cause I was really liked his artistry. So at one point I was like, I'm just going to grow up, just face it and see what he did once and for all. And like, that was pretty devastating experience. Cause I was like, <clears throat> there's no way that he went through all this shit and he didn't do anything. I felt horrible. I felt so bad because the more and more you look, the more innocent he becomes. So after Leaving Neverland came out, at this point, I already knew he was totally innocent. And I had already known about Wade and James because I'd done this research. And so I, I had a meltdown when that was airing. I couldn't believe that they were taking away voices of actual victims, including myself. Um, mm -hmm. And I just kind of went on the internet and tried to find everything I could find. And then I found Danny Wu's YouTube channel and he had a did uh, videos. They were awesome. And then I had seen that he was going to be interviewing someone that knew uh, the first accuser. And so like I had made a connection with someone else for him to potentially interview, but it didn't work out. But uh, we just stayed in touch. I sent him uh, information here and there. And he and uh, Shania, I don't know if it's Shania or Shania Kumar, they're the two people that put it together. Um, they brought me on board and we just uh, helped help more with the Amazon version. But yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm so, so grateful to both of them um, to be involved with the project, but yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Kind of all over the place. No, no, that's perfect. So, so, so you, um, are you familiar with, I mean, are you in the world of like child sexual abuse or anything? Is that something near and dear to your heart as well? Yeah. Um, I was, four and I had it was someone I he was married to my aunt that's what I refer to him as 
And I was going to wait till he died to tell anyone because I didn't want to tear the family apart. I knew if I had told anyone when I was four, like my dad would probably be behind bars for murdering him. So when Leaving Neverland came out, I had a meltdown and I got drunk and I just like went on Facebook Messenger and told all my aunts. What's the most surprising thing to me is that no one was surprised. And it turns out that two other cousins of mine were also victims of his. So he's no longer in our family, but. Um, I'm really sorry to hear that. Just. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. Bo- both of you come from this world and see the darkness and evil that it is. Oh, but you yeah. also realize that, you know, going after going on a wild or on a witch hunt or after people who are falsely accused is just as detrimental to the cause as it is finding the true justice, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, hundred percent. And and um, we have a history of that, you know, in this country of of um, I guess false accusations or the wrong person behind bars in that way, um, just because you know. I don't even want to say it's satisfying. It's just, you know, sometimes you just want justice for something and in that way. And so my whole thing with leaving everyone was like, you know, take a deep breath and let's, you know, and because it was such a gut punch in a way that it was designed that way, that you really, there was no air for any other kind of like conversation. But once now with some distance, which I think was perfect with square one, there's now some distance and time in between that people can start you know, at least take accepting, you know, another conversation, another side to something. So it was, it was perfect timing, but also, you know, it was led with facts, you know, and, and, um, and that always helps too. And facts and, and knowledge basically. And as opposed to, you know, and I, the thing was just leaving Neverland, you know, the problem that I have with it mainly is they don't even care if it was true or not. Like, you know, in terms of with the whole Brett Barnes situation where, you know, he was trying to sue to get himself, his name taken out of the movie because he's like, that never happened to me. And I strongly defend Michael. They gave him the, you know, the legal middle finger and said, well, we don't care. That's ridiculous. You know, we're using it anyway. And so they took his privacy. This is a person that's, you know, didn't even want to be named in anything and now and then just spread him all over the world in that way implying that he had been sexually abused by michael jackson because it fit their narrative and so that's the kind of stuff that frustrates me is that they really don't care it was all about money and i said that in the beginning when people didn't believe that they were suing the estate before this came out and you know they made it this crusade like oh no we care about victims and we're going to be you know forefront people for the victims well once their interviews started co- contradicting and they realized that it could hurt their lawsuit. They were mighty quiet. They basically shut up and they haven't been, you know, in, been interviewed since because they know it's going to hurt their legal chances of winning money. So their, their heart's not even in the right place in that. Sense, yeah. You know? It's interesting. There's one thing that stuck out to me about leaving Neverland in that, you know, like I said, it was so driven emotionally to make you, kind of feel dirty about Michael mm-hmm. Jackson. That's just mm-hmm. what it felt like. Oh, 100%. What, I think it was Wade's. Wade said he just wanted it to be on the record. And I looked at my girlfriend who was watching with me. I said, why is he suing for $12 million then? Why why not sue for $1? And like, make it symbolic. Yeah. Like we, like I said, my, uh, Chris, ha- Chris had a, a vic- uh, best friend who was a victim of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. And he just wanted it on the record. They kept throwing money and money after him. And it got up to two million dollars, where the where the lawyer said okay, and the, he's like, I want it on record, you know. Mm-hmm. Sue for a dollar if that's if you're you know you have a career, mm-hmm. sue for a dollar and let you know you'll you'll write a book and you'll make so much money off the back end. But I didn't understand why the monetary number was so high if if all he wanted was justice. That's well, the one thing that stuck out to me. Uh, Mark, you said twelve million. It's far more than that. that they're suing for. Yeah, it's, it's, like, a, it's around a hundred something. Million. Oh, holy crap! Then yeah. yeah, okay. I thought I thought in the Leaving Neverland there was like a twelve million dollar suit or something. I could be wrong. Not I with Wade. Wrong. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Please for I. It's been. I only watched that shit show once. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, you know, for me it was really hard to like. I haven't watched it fully. I've watched clips of it because I literally want to take my shoe off and throw it at the screen just because 
you know, there's certain things I see that other people probably won't even see just knowing Wade so well, but also just being a victim myself, like no parent in their right mind when they're reminiscing about, you know, Michael Jackson, are they smiling or, or happy? You know, this is yeah. someone that molested their kid. Why is, you know, Stephanie, you know, um, giggling and, and, and happy and smiling about, you know, Michael Jackson stuff. Like at, that's a monster to her. At one point she says that she's like, he doesn't know this, but I would like listen in and then sneak away. What mother would do that if she knew that her son was being sexually abused behind that door? Why would she be laughing about that? That makes no sense. Yeah. And that's the thing. And, and Wade's, you know, mom, same thing. It's like those kind of things, you know, as a parent, you're, you're thinking of it and you look back and you're like, he tricked us. He made us feel like a family. He made it, you know, you're, you, you should have anger inside of you, not happiness, not joy. But what they did was very smart. Dan Reed, he basically, he, he told some truth in the beginning, which is how they met, you know, Michael Jackson. So you, you, as a viewer, you, you trust these people. You're like, okay, there's genuine emotion here. They met Michael Jackson. Okay. I get it. I trust them because their story checks out and I can see that they're happy. And then they switch it on you and you don't even know that they switched it on you. And that's the trick. That's a trickery that they did, but it's like, so in a way it was ingenious, but I mean, I saw right through it because I know them. I mean, I, I know Wade very well. And, and um, James, I never in interviews would talk about because I don't know him. I never knew him. So I never felt comfortable talking about um, James. But then when the train station lie hit, I felt very comfortable <laughs> about talking about James in that way because he, you know, there's a bunch of other lies that he had told. And so I was just like, okay, now I know enough that I know he's lying as well. Mm -hmm. Tosh, this is Chris. I'm the quiet one. Uh -huh. So my question for you at this point is, are, would you agree that leaving Neverland was basically all for ratings? I think it was all for, I would hope it was all for ratings. You know, the thing is, is that it, for me, it was a hit piece. It literally was, um, you know, it had big muscle behind it, it had HBO behind it um, in the States. HBO at the time, if you don't remember, um, it was in its last season of Game of Thrones. And so no, um, no network, no um, trade, you know, whether it's Hollywood Porter or Daily Variety wanted to go against HBO because there goes their access to Game of Thrones, you know. So everyone was on HBO's bidding. I mean, we know what that last season ended up being, but it, at that point it hadn't come out yet. And so they really were scared to go against the big HBO. So they everyone was tweeting about HBO and it got all the support and then they got Oprah on board to sell it, you know, as well. And so it was really a hit piece in a way designed to destroy a legacy. So yes, it was for ratings, but every time they use my uncle's name, it's usually for ratings. It's like, right, they, don't, right. they don't want anything positive. You know, they won't talk about anything positive. They'll always talk about, you know, the, um, the scandals or stuff like that, that, you know, once you look beyond, you'll see that they're, they have no weight to them. Okay. Gotcha. As, as I suspected. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean this whole, I think that what's more disheartening, um, this, oh, I can't even say the words correctly. It's heartening. Yeah. Thank disheartening. You. Yeah. It was a lot longer than I thought it was, um, was that, um, you know, when you have reputable, um, networks that now because of the whole TMZ t um, blog kind of atmosphere, they have to keep up. They have to get the clicks as well. So now they're starting to do things that, you know, we used to think, oh, they were straight and narrow. And now, no, now they will, you know, they will imply stuff or they'll get, they'll put a heading headline in there to grab attention. That's not true. And so it really, I always knew the media was like that, you know, because I saw that in 2005 with my uncle, you know, I, I lived at Neverland when the trial happened and I would literally have the TV on flipping through channels and see all the stuff about the testimony. And then Tom Mesereau, which who was my uncle's um, um, lawyer would come back to, to Neverland with my uncle. And I would ask Tom privately, like, how did it go today? And he'd be like, Oh my gosh, it went so well. This person got caught in the lie that, and this person got caught in a lie. This person, you know, admitted da da da. And then I would be like, I don't see any of that on TV. So either it was he, not on television. Oh, it wasn't at all. And I was like, so either he's overly confident and just trying to tell me something that I want to hear, or they're just lying out of their teeth. And I switched through every channel trying to get 
a fair assessment and there just wasn't any. And so I don't blame the public. I really don't because at the end of the day, they only saw one side to the point where they're like, yeah, he did it because we got told that he did it. We got told about this story about, you know, this maid saw him in the shower, you know, with, with a boy, but then that maid gets on the stand and um, Tom cross examines her. And she's like, Oh, maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe it was just Michael. Maybe it wasn't the boy, you know? And it's like, it's like, but they don't report that. They just told, Oh, Michael found in the shower with a boy, you know? So those kind of things, you know, really irritate me because it's like, you know, they don't, they stuck around for all the gossip, but not for the truth. And that's what we're seeing with, you know, this whole leaving Neverland. It's like the story has been told. I've been told that by media, oh, we already talked about leaving Neverland. We don't need your side of the story anymore. We got all we can out of it. And I'm like, that's not how it should work. You know, if there's some, if you, you should revise it, if you found out there's lies in there, like the train station and the Grand Canyon and a particular dinner that I was physically at that um, they claimed, um, Wade claims um, that he went to a dinner before his testimony, the day before his testimony, and saw my uncle and how he interacted with um, his daughter, Paris, and he was like really like out of it and whatever. And that's when Wade decided he had to lie and protect his friend. And I'm like, that dinner happened after his testimony. And I said that on Twitter and sure enough, it got cut out of the UK version. So it's like, they're not even, they're lying. And then when they get caught, they make edits. And this, the, the original HBO thing, it's a lot shorter now than it was when it first got aired because there's all these lies that have been cut out of it. And so I think that's very um, dishonest. And it's in, I'm very upset at the media for not highlighting that. Mm-hmm. So the media is basically catering to the masses for ratings. Yes. Like they, and which they're still doing today, yeah, which, say, yeah. different, which, which just with different subjects, different which they, subjects. which they've always done. They've always it's done. It's horrible. And, to, and your, your point about TMZ and how they've changed the world. And now HBO is the new TMZ. That's a, that's a, what a great point. I mean, Thank that's, you. it's really, it's sad, but, so so accurate and it and it, it's you know someone that is all about justice it bothers me because there's nowhere that you i mean i'm you're, you're starting to have to go to like places like youtube and podcasts you know to get the truth and that's you know i'm happy that they exist and that's exactly what we did you know when um leaving neverland came out it was like only a lot of the youtube and podcast people you know, would hear our side of the story. And that's kind of how I met Danny was Danny. Um, basically, he's like, would you and Brandy be willing to be interviewed by me? And I didn't know this guy at all. You know, I'm, I didn't, and I didn't even really care what his numbers were or anything. I was just like, if he's willing to hear my side of the story, then I'm willing to, you know, be there for it. And so, and that's how I met Danny. <laughs> and yeah. You and know, and that's kind of our philosophy on it as well is we've had some guests on that speak some pretty radical things, but that's mm -hmm. not, that's not our job to keep someone from a, expressing their beliefs or their thoughts. Exactly. You know, so we're, we're always open to having people over. And what we're finding is back in the day, there was no internet. There was no decentralized point of information like there is now. <clears throat> you had two or three news organizations all getting their source from the same place and feeding it to us like, just sheep, right? They're just spoon feeding yeah. us all day. Now we're finding that where information can be decentralized. So it's not always CNN and NBC and Fox or whoever yeah. mm -hmm. that have this information. The challenge with that though, like to your point is with me too. And with these types of cases, you get some people who cling on to that, right? Cause they want attention yeah. or something. Yeah. So you just have to be more vigilant about the data that you get, but we're so blessed now to have these different modes of information and how yes. to get it. And, 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 and that's why I hope to amplify, amplify those, you know, because it really had been, um, it was really frustrating when, you know, places that I knew had millions and millions of viewers, they were, would not allow me or Brandy to be on their channel, you know, telling another side of the story. It was almost like, you can't question these guys, you know, you can't, this is the narrative and we're going with it. So, right. you know, to shut up and, and so it, it kind of forced us in, in a good way too, because it came 
it became at the same time more organic and homegrown in that way in terms of who we got to talk to and everything like that. And it, it was a, you know, almost like a grassroots kind of um, thing in terms of this change that happened from the combatantness of, of leaving Neverland. Yeah, Wasn't and, there an it, interview, Taj, that you were supposed to do, but it didn't work out or something like yes, that? Yes. Um, Good Morning America. Um, basically, in the afternoon, I was just driving around killing time. And um, once it was supposed to be me and Brandy and they received a call from, and I'm not going to name names because, but you can probably assume from someone very high up, you know, a talk show host, very high up that basically from their office that said that killed our interview. And I just That is unbelievable. Well, it, you know, it just showed me that they weren't interested in the truth. They're just, you know, um, it was about um, selling a story in that way. And and that frustrated me more than anything because it was like, I was looking forward to it. I had been on Good Morning America back in the day with 3T and I knew it was a huge opportunity and stuff like that. And Brandy, who has been hidden from the media in that way because she kills Wade's narrative about, you know, Wade dating my uncle, which is ridiculous because Brandy dated Wade for over seven years during his, um, the teenage years. From wow. puppy love all the way up, but you. Will I never didn't even know it. that. So thank oh, you for really? sharing. Yeah, oh, no. well, I'll be honest. I I'm really con. My my concern is justice and truth. Yeah. Yeah. And trust me, as big a fan as I am, I I'm not you know in the world like yeah, some yeah. fans are. So I, that's um that's amazing to me. So Wade and Brandy dated for seven years. Over seven years. I, I told oh, her, no. I told her to say seven years. Cause I didn't want it to be like, if it was, if it was seven and a half years or eight years, I didn't want to be accused of over exaggerating. Right. And you but don't want to, you don't want to be caught like, Oh, it's seven and a half. It's like, Oh, it's only seven. So they're yeah. going to get you on semantics. Right. Exactly. Um, but yeah. Tosh, who, how did they meet? How did, uh, Wade <laughs> I was just, yeah. I was just about to get to that. So Wade, you know, Wade did a lot of stuff with like LA gear, the promotion um, with my uncle. And so did Brandy. And so Wade developed a crush on Brandy and asked my uncle if he could invite Brandy to Neverland so that they could get to know each other. So Brandy and Wade met through my uncle, basically. My uncle set wow. them up, which is completely the different narrative of how Michael was jealous of girls, you know, talking to his quote unquote, you know, um, victims and all that stuff. It's, it's baloney. And Wade and Brandy dated all the way up to, I call it the, well, I don't even know. You probably don't even know the story. Uh, I don't look, this is your time. I, I love story time. We actually have like a special thing for story time. Can, <laughs> can we play it? Hold on. We've got it for you. Sure. Okay. We're going to play it now. It's time for story time, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Go for it. it. Go for it, Tosh. <laughs> well, I was just saying that, you know, Wade dated Brandy all throughout his teenage years and, and all that stuff. And, and it's known that's why he's never, he can't question Brandy and neither can his friends, you know, because they know it's the truth that Brandy and him dated for all that time. But not only that, Wade, the reason Brandy and Wade broke up is because Brandy, um, Wade cheated on Brandy with a famous singer and this famous singer, I mean, you can say it, Jess, I won't say it, but this famous singer, we don't want to name drop. I mean, we're we're here. We're all in good faith here, right? Oh no, it's it's already known. It's, it's oh okay. Oh. <laughs> I just so share it because we want okay. now. I want to know. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, Brittany and Justin Timberlake were like the two biggest items at that time, and yeah. it, it's known that someone came in and basically, you know, um, cheated. Uh, Brittany cheated on someone um, and broke up Justin and her's relationship. That's where the "Cry Me a River" comes from. That video. And whatever. No way. And that, I, love, I love the inside stuff. This is, and, this is and, good. And that person was Wade Robson, who was choreographing for NSYNC at the time. And so that was the thing. That's the reason why Brandy broke up with Wade. And that's the reason why um, Justin broke up with Britney was because of Wade Robson. And Wade went off to choreograph with Britney for a time. And then she dumped him. I don't know what happened there. I, but he, he had, he burnt his bridges in the choreograph choreography graphing world and that's why he has no footing anymore that's why because no one wants to work with him anymore tonight on tmz of, <laughs> no it's, i mean it's it, you can look it up it's right there so it's not I some. Would, it was yeah. actually a lifetime move i just saw this one clip but it 
apparently it came to light when Justin and Brittany were both doing Saturday Night Live. And there's this clip of these actors playing Justin and Brittany and Justin's reading this note. And he looks at it and he goes, Wade? So this is like documented, like in Lifetime movies and stuff. It's not a secret. Yeah. And that's the thing. I would never feel, cl- I don't want to rumor anything. You know, whatever I tell you, you can look it up. And that's always how you should look, approach anything. It's like, don't just listen to my words, look it up. It's there, you know? And I think that's what the brilliance of square one is, is if you want to look up anything, here it is, you know, in that way, as opposed to them, which is like, oh no, trust us and with blind faith, don't look up anything, you know, just trust us. And that's the difference. One side is saying, no, do your homework. We don't care. Do your homework. The more you look up Michael Jackson, the more you study him, you'll realize he was innocent. While the other side's like, no, 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 no. Just watch Leaving Neverland and case is closed. Right. Yeah. Just for prosecution, no defense, just shut up. Yeah. And I'll be honest, that that's kind of, like I said, as the lay person who was alive and watching the trials initially and just being fed this information, whatever they wanted us to have. Yeah. And then seeing square one that raised enough reasonable doubt. I've gone down the rabbit hole since and all yeah. I see are just picks at everything. <laughs> and we He's... definitely can go through. We definitely have a couple questions from that, but I'm yeah. I'm really enjoying how you're sharing everything. So please continue You know where, your thought path, path on where you're at and what we want to talk about. No, I was just saying, so that was just one of the things. So that's why Wade had lost communication with our family because he had cheated on Brandy. And that's why he was so excited when I reached out to him about the memorial because our family wasn't talking to him anymore. I didn't realize that at the time, you know, he had been ostracized from the family. Um, So, you know, I still regret inviting him to the memorial, but I felt like, you know, I wanted to invite whoever was close to my uncle or that I felt was close to my uncle at the time. And I was, he was one of those names that could slip through that no one would remember. And so right. that was the, that was the problem that I had with it, but it's just like, you know, so he, he plays this innocent victim, you know, in this way, but Wade was anything but innocent and the dancing community, which has gone, a lot of them have gone on record who have known both Michael and Wade. They believe Michael, you know? And so it's like, there's a problem when your own, you know, peers don't believe you in that way. And it's like, and it's not a lack of, you know, um, them just saying, oh, we want, we want to believe Michael. It's just that they know Wade's character. So he's been shunned in the choreography industry then? Yeah. He's, I mean, that's why, that's why he's not in it anymore. I mean, he's, Uh and I'll be he honest, was, I didn't know that he was kind of booted. I, I'm not that familiar with the ins and outs of that. I just he, knew that he was a choreographer. I just he didn't was know one of the biggest was. choreographers. He was doing NSYNC and Britney Spears at the time of you know the boy band craze. Right. He was he was the hottest choreographer at that point, and so it just it goes to show you that you know you burn enough bridges, and then all of a sudden you have nowhere else to go in that way. And and he always built his career on being the hottest choreographer at the time. So I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, look, you make personal decisions. You, you suffer consequences, unfortunately, you know, if, if you're the, if you're a good person, I think the thing, or you blame others, which is what he did, you know? Yeah. It sounds like it, you know? So that's, that's, that's why I have really no respect for him is because, you know, we all face hardships. We all face setbacks, but Wade's been known, you know, Wade blamed Michael for his dad's uh, suicide, which had nothing to do with, michael jackson at all but somehow they twisted it to make it seem like you know his dad was jealous of michael which is not true at all you know wait so hold on a second i i just got a weird blow up in my face thing so wade's dad committed suicide and chandler jones and evan chandler's dad or evan chandler committed suicide yes yeah the way both both fathers of accusers of alleged victims committed suicide yes um you know that seems odd yeah, well, why Wade's, wouldn't you bring that up in Leaving Neverland? You know, seems well, relevant, but why, why wouldn't? You yeah, that up- was not brought up. That is a bombshell for me. I did not know that Wade's yeah. father committed suicide. Yeah. Also, I just knew of Evan after Square yeah. One. Well, Wade, you know, Wade's family, you know, they they left Australia. Um, the father stayed, and and so they left to pursue America and and you know, the American dream, and so. You know, they, Wade stopped having a lot of contact with his his father and, and stuff like that. And and I think there's a I don't want to say a hurt, but there's something like, you know, there's probably some guilt in there. And it's easy to blame Michael for that, you know, in a way. But Michael had nothing to do with that. You well, know. Oh, well, look, you, go ahead. 
Oh, go ahead, Jess. I was in Living Neverland. Wade had said something that he had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder yep. or something, mm-hmm. and yeah. that when this happened, like Wade just wanted him to go away. Which um, he's a kid. I don't blame you know kids for having these feelings, but exactly, yeah. It's none of that involves Michael Jackson. That's a family issue, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I had no idea that that is a bombshell for me. I, I that I've was seen not it in advertised. Some papers. Yeah, I've 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 seen it in some newspapers about Wade blaming Michael Jackson for you know, his dad's death and, and them running stories about it. So that's why I brought it up because it's, that's very frustrating to me. It's almost like, you know, you can blame Michael Jackson for anything in that way. And so that was one. I blame him for good music, (laughs) which you should, which you should. I mean, and and arguably still the best uh, music video of all time. Come on. Which is for you, which is thriller. Of course. Okay. okay. I I I mean, don't get me wrong. Billy Jean's phenomenal. I mean, they're all great in their own, my favorite is Smooth Criminal. That's why I was asking. Oh, Smooth Criminal is great too. Good <laughs> yeah. song. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but so I think the thing that, you know, one of the things that's just so frustrating about this whole thing is just, we, the, you know, before Square One, it was like, it was very hard to tell the story and and to just have people listen. I think Square One put it in such a great bite, not even bite size, but just a w- tangible way for people to see it visually you know, and go, wait a minute. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Or, okay, I understand that. See, I was around for, you know, the, the first allegation, you know, um, and I say, I, me and my brothers were around. We actually, um, when the first allegations hit, we flew. What year was that? Was that 93 then? Yes. That was 93. That was 93. Okay, so, you, so you would have been 22 ish or 21, 22, right? 21, I'm, 21. I'm, I'm 19, 1973. So oh, 73. Okay. So, so you would have been 20, 1920. Yeah. 19, yeah. Okay. Okay. And my mom was still alive at that point. And, and, um, I, I, I'll never forget. She's like, you, you got to leave school. You know, your uncle needs you. And, um, we were on a plane like within hours to fly up to Asia to be with him because we've always been that close to him, me and my brothers. And they, he explained to us that there's, you know, these people lying about him and he's going to fight it. He's, he's, upset about it you know and he was he was angry which is the emotion that you would expect he was he's like i'm not gonna let them get away with this i know who's behind this blah 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 and well, so- interesting if i may uh interestingly enough when i remember him doing those uh video recordings and then putting them on television <laughs> you can tell he's angry yes you can you tell can- you can tell a serious there is an underlying anger out now yeah. seeing it through a different lens you know, the innocent and the guilty would probably deny it, but he had such underlying anger underneath that, that he was trying to choke down. You know, it, it was a mixture of anger and hurt. And and I think that was the thing, because one of the things that he never expected, he never expected, I mean, there's always been tabloids and, you know, this was the time of, you know, court um, of hard copy and, and current affair, you know, that's when they were taking off and they just they had a field day with it. And yeah, they really did. I remember that was those tabloid type television shows. Yes. And one of the people, um, AJ Bensa, Bensa um, he actually, um, was it New York times or New York post that uh, unveiled that he was hired. His firm was hired by Harvey Weinstein to um, make up stories, to kind of spin stories, to keep Harvey off the headlines. Mm-hmm. And one, of, and one of the people that they found out they did that to was Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. So, so they use they use Michael's allegations to bury what Weinstein was doing exactly. in the entire mm-hmm. time in his exactly oh and, gosh and Hollywood knew it which is one of the things why I'm not you know and this is a, this is an industry that I want to be part of in terms of like I've always wanted to be a director and I'm just like this with this whole leaving Neverland I'm literally burning bridges like with a match every place I go like. Well, there goes Daily Variety because I just yelled at them. There goes Hollywood Reporter because I just yelled at them. There goes HBO because I just yelled at them. There goes Sundance, which is, you know, um, a place that I thought I could debut something at. And so, but at the same time, it's all about justice. And I could care less if they're lying about my uncle or if they're lying about a scenario or my family. So for me, yes, that's, that's the thing. Like, it's all about justice and it's all about truth. And so... I'll stand by that. And, and, you know, it, it's really hard when people go, Oh, well, you weren't there. It's like, you know, but neither were you. And so 
people's words matter even more, you know, in that right. room. If you weren't, if both people weren't, if you're not there and, and the guy is, is no longer there to defend himself, then the words of the accuser matters and their, and their track record matters. Well, what was so interesting is how all of the cases built on the Sandy foundation that was the original yeah. case. Yes. So the truth is it is the house of cards. If you can, if you can really disprove one of those foundation pieces, the whole thing really doesn't stand on its own. It sure. doesn't stand on its own. And it's all been, and it's all been built very flimsily in terms of with the, you know, with the 2005 case. I mean, they changed the date of the allegations because they realized that, you know, Michael wasn't, I, I think either Michael wasn't there at Neverland or they had done a rebuttal video. And so they pushed back the date of the allegation, the prosecution did and mm -hmm. said it was another date. And the date that, <laughs> that they pushed it back was after the Martin Brashear documentary where everyone was upset and up in arms. So they want, they want the public See, the public doesn't even know this, but the, they want the public to, to, to believe that, you know, right when Michael Jackson was at the most scrutiny that he could be because of Martin Brashear documentary, he decides that's what I'm going to molest this kid right but now. That was after he had already kidnapped them from molestation yeah. that didn't even <laughs> happen yet. Yeah. Because he held them hostage somehow. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like if you, if you do the, if you look through the court documents and you actually look through the, the top, the time signatures and, and, and linear um, everything, you'll realize that it never made sense. It was just sound bites that the media fed to the people and the media has gone on record. I've um, I think it was the head of CNN or the owner of CNN that's basically said that, you know, they would have made way more money if Michael was guilty and that's, you know, and so you, you should, as a news organization, you should be impartial, you know, and, and be for the truth, not about how much money you were going to make, you know? So that's why I feel like all those medias lean towards one way because they wanted him to be guilty. I mean, Oprah did, Oprah did a, a episode on child molestation during the jury selection of Michael's no, case. During the deliberations before the verdict, but after the trial. Yeah. So as it was well. like in that. Wow. So, so it's like, that's the thing like that bothers me is like, there's so much manipulation going on and that normal, when I say normal people, I just meant the average public doesn't even understand. But once you go down that rabbit hole, as you used to say, you know, it's like, this all becomes clear that this guy was just, he was someone that was misunderstood, but you know, that's enough for them. It's almost like that movie where it's like the neighbor that's just misunderstood or this, you know, I don't even like to use the word weird, this different neighbor, you know, and so they, you know, there's a crime that happens and they all point to the neighbor that no one understands. It's like, oh, he did it because right. he's different or he's different yeah. or, he's you different, know, right. or he looks unique. different. Unique. Say unique. Well, I've always used the word <laughs> unique, you know, I just, um, <laughs> but I've always used it because he was, he was, he was one of a kind. He was unique. And his, his life growing up was unique. I mean, this is a, this is a guy that was singing professionally at the age of like six you know, years old and was traveling on tour buses and this and that. And, you know, people always go, well, it was, it's weird for an adult to be friends with a kid. And I'm like, but Michael was friends with Diana Ross and Stevie Wonder and, and Martin Gay, And he was a kid friends with an adult. And that wasn't weird at all. And right. so that's the thing. He grew up in that world of like Motown where it's like, they were just his peers. So he never looked at it as like, I'm not supposed to be friends with kids because I'm an adult now. And I always make a joke about back to the future. No one ever questions Marty and doc's relationship, you know? In yeah. I mean, you know, probably wouldn't fly Good in today's point. world. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I never, it's because you don't, movie. you don't think like that. You don't think, well, you know, why is Marty over doc's house and, you know, watching doc stuff, what's going on there, you know, but maybe now in today's more cynical world, you know, five, 10 years from now, it won't hold up because people will be looking at it differently in, in, a, in a darker way, I should say. That's a really good point. I mean, it's kind of funny because akin to how I think Michael saw the world, like mm -hmm. through those childlike eyes is like, I've, I've, I've walked by a sandbox and just plopped down next to a kid and started playing in the sand. Cause I like yeah. sandcastles. I yeah. mean, what's wrong with that? You know, it's just unfortunate how it can get viewed and skewed and you're, with all the evilness we see, you know? And that's a great point. You're not allowed to do that anymore. Like that's, that's just like, it's, it's almost like robbing humanity in a way, you know, you can't even, you have to be careful just saying hi to a kid 
today, you know, or just waving at them just because they, they make a face at you and you think it's funny, you know, it's like, you know, then you get the parent that looks at you like, you know, stay away from my kid. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. It's like, I've got that thing with uh, crying babies where I can look at a crying baby and then they'll stop. Yeah. And the parent looks at me like there's an arm growing out of my head. I look at them. I just shrug. I go, I, I don't know what it is. I walk away and I'll like back away because it, it can be seen as this weird thing, right? It's yeah. like creepy now. It's, it's got painted such a dark light now because of the allegations. And, and, and it's, you know, I mean, it, as a parent, you should always be cautious, but it's just sad because it, there's a loss of innocence now in that way. And I grew up, you know, wanting to always be a child. I, I grew up in Michael's world or my uncle's world. And I saw the benefits of that. Like I never wanted to grow up and I still don't want to grow up. I still refuse to know my age. I still, you know, play hide and go, go seek with my cousins, you know, all the time. And, you know, this grown guy playing, but it's so much fun. And it's like, the thing is, is that I just, I've, I've seen the other side and it's just bills and payments and credit and debt. And it's like, it's not fun, you know? And that's a thing. Like, so it's like being a child, sometimes it, it, you, you can escape that world, you know? I mean, yeah. it's, you know, trust me, we all have that, but I'm just saying that in that way, it's like, you know, I hated the words grow up, just, you know, you should grow up, you know? I just didn't like those words at all. I think, you know, I totally get it. I mean, it, it's interesting. We do have to recapture that in, in ourselves at times, right? Spielberg has that magic. Like Spielberg would always talk about that was the secret of his, his directing was he, he was a big kid. You know, yeah. he never, you know, I don't know, you know, as a family man, he might've lost some of that, you know, because he's not been the same, but when he was doing those movies like E.T. and Jurassic Park, he was just that big kid playing in that sandcastle or the sandbox, I should say. Exactly. You know? Totally makes sense. So, so to go back just a little bit, yeah, I I remember Oprah being very pro Michael. What for a, in the beginning? No, we're talking like eight mid eighties when he was hot, right? Mm -hmm. When she was growing her audience. Oprah goes with what the audience like. Because, That's my point, right? That's yeah. what I'm trying to point at is like I remember yeah. in the mid eighties, I thought she was on he was on her show and she was gushing. Oprah. That's actually the most famous yeah. interview of all time. The one that they did together in uh, February 1993 is that interview is viewed by the most people of all time. Yeah. It's so he, my uncle, basically the Oprah interview that happened, I think it's like 93 million people saw it. It's the most viewed interview of, of all time over president, wow. over anything. Um, so, you know, he basically put her on the international map because a lot of people had no clue internationally who Oprah was. So he made Oprah an international star because people tuned in from all over the world to see it. And he chose Oprah to do it. And so that is another reason why it feels such a, like a backstab because, you know, Oprah has had these opportunities that our family has given her. Same thing with my grandma who gave her the first interview with the kids and her, you know, once Michael passed and it was in such high demand and Oprah comes, you know, slithering back, basically saying, you know, Michael was misunderstood and I want the world to see who Michael truly was. Let me do this interview. And I was there for that. I actually heard that with my own ears. And then, you know, here we are, you know, later on and she's over here doing a special about child molestation saying, oh, it's bigger than Michael Jackson, but has every person in the audience is, is a child abuse victim. It was like, it's almost like a, a court case where the jury is actually rigged in that way, where everyone is designed to be a support system for Wayne and James, even though they're telling lies. And she covered for them at times. She, she helped them at times in that way. And it just, it really bothers me. And I think the other thing that people don't understand, I know I'm talking a lot and I'll, I'll be quiet. For no, a please, no, <laughs> please share, share. This is, this is the truth though. We, we want the truth to be exposed. Well, from what I heard and a, a magazine or an, um, a newspaper printed that Wade and J uh, Wade had accused the family and Michael Jackson's um, production companies of, of kind of aiding and abetting, you know, um, this mol molestation. And that was supposedly in the special that Oprah did. Well, they cut that out because we could sue if that was the case, you know, because Michael's no longer For liable, alive. right? Yep. Yeah. Michael, 
you know, we the dead can't sue, which is one of the reasons why it's so frustrating. We have no leg to stand in as a family of suing these guys for lying. Do but, you have a trust of some sort that, the, that can sue or no? No, no the, you can't you can't sue for libel or, or um defamation or, or slander for if um if the person is dead or deceased. Okay. Yeah. So you I can make up any story I want about Elvis and not get sued. Um you know, and, it, and it's the saddest thing that that's, you know, there's no protection there, but that's what they had going for them as well. Because most people go, well, why isn't the family suing then if it's, you know, if that's the case? And so, but yeah, so what, what Wade had to do to get money, you know, was sue the estate. He had to sue the estate and basically pretend that, you know, the production companies were involved in all this as a as a hush hush, you know, and help enable it in that way. And that's what they're doing now. They're suing the estate, you know, right. for that, for that reason, because Michael Jackson is no longer alive to sue. I'm actually going to jump back a little bit there, Taj, yeah. because um, we were talking about his choreography career and yeah. then the lawsuit, but Ooh. the last thing he tried to pursue choreography wise was the NJ one production in Las Vegas. Yeah. And when he didn't get that, Ooh, lawsuit. Yes. And I don't think they know that. Um, so basically what happened was Wade, you know, from the, the memorial, you know, actually 24 hours after, um, within 24 hours of Michael passing, he sent, um, so you think, so you think you can dance. He, yeah. He sent them basically um, an email saying, you know, Hey, if you ever do a tribute of Michael Jackson, I want to be involved, you know? So, and then um, he also on the MTV awards where Janet did a tribute to Michael. He's in, he's one of the dancers of that. So he was doing tributes to Michael all the way up until, as Jess said, basically he got denied the Cirque du Soleil job. And that's when all of a sudden he decides to write this book. So it's very convenient, right? (laughs) Yes. It's basically, so I, it's like, I honestly feel if he would have gotten that Cirque job, none of this would have happened. Yeah, and but that's, then it wouldn't be, be as good of a show, though. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's I mean that tells you something it, that his mor- morale, his morals are based on you know can he make money or not. It seems obvious that he's grasping at straws because he doesn't he doesn't have anything. He doesn't have anything, and 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 he even got caught lying by because of the uh, statute of limitations. Basically, he had to say that he didn't know the estate existed because it was a certain amount of years that he had to file this claim. So he lies and says, Oh, I didn't know this is the Michael Jackson estate existed. Well, they went back to him and said, well, then how did you meet with the Michael Jackson estate when it came to Cirque du Soleil? Yeah. Um, Cause you met with John Branca, who's Michael Jackson, you know, head of Michael Jackson's estate. And so that's one of the reasons the judge basically throughout the case saying no, no person in their right mind would believe these guys. And mm-hmm. that's literally what the judge said. You know, and because Wade just kept lying. And so the dates are convenient to whatever the lawsuit will allow. Right. So, I mean, it's it's and it's so different in a civil case, unlike a criminal case where criminal case must be unanimous. And a civil case, I believe, is just a majority, isn't it? Like a simple majority, which is what they were probably hoping with leaving Neverland to sway kind of, quote unquote, the jury pool to think he's he's a monster or scaring the estate to like, let's just settle because we don't want the heat anymore let's just give in right so that's where we're at right now Mm -hmm. um i i watched square one about four or five times four and a half times sorry i didn't watch it i didn't watch double digits guys i'm very (laughs) sorry but we took a couple notes um and i i hope i'm gonna ask these questions correctly a lot of these are clarification please understand if there's something that i'm not asking correctly Please feel free to correct us. I definitely want to get back to some of this other stuff, but like I, I know that a lot of listeners are really interested in, you know, the square one stuff and let's do it. You know, making sure that we can do it. Yeah. So, so Taj, I'm going to just go down my list, and you know, if there's anything that I misunderstood in the documentary, correct me because I have a comprehension problem sometimes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about the photo shoot. I remember the the beginning, the risque photo, right with with uh, with Michael. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what I found interesting, what I really liked about Danny is Danny, for example, had juror eight and juror nine, I think he had two jurors, but in your case, you spoke about that, but there, was there anyone else that he had recorded to corroborate 
what you had said or any of your brothers or anybody get why he, anyone else wasn't on footage, you know, just to get on record for that. Um, you mean in terms of the photo shoot? Yeah, the photo shoot part. Because remember, I remember that being a big emphasis in the beginning about this, you know, the sensuality or the sexuality of the oh, photos. And yeah. that that one guy saying how, you know, he, that's all he wanted to do was take pictures of boys or some. Mm. No, I mean, there were people there, you know, in terms of that. Karen Fay has spoke up about it in terms of, okay. you know, so Which there were Michael's uh, makeup assistant. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I just want to make sure it. because it wasn't a, everyone I, I, only had you on it. Yeah. No, oh, it, was, sure. it was a, it was a limited set, but it wasn't like just Michael and us. Right. Know, right. Photographer in that way. So that's why I'm, you know, they can't go too far on it because they're people that have collaborated and said, basically, no, 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 we were there. I mean, first of all, I, um, you know, I'm very bashful about my body <laughs> in general, you know, in that way. But we were at that time with 3T, we were called, you know, we were sex symbols. In that yeah, way. you're a hot, like a hot commodity type yeah, thing. And I, had, I actually had a six pack at one point, you know. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, it was one of those things. But we also were, you know, our main target audience was women. And we were trying to be sexy for them in that way. And, you know, we were known as kind of like a saccharine group in terms of very, you know, we were in the time that like Jodeci was and Snoop Dogg, yeah, Dr. Dre. Absolutely. So we were, you know, we weren't very edgy in that, in that uh, and so we, we wanted to do something that cut more and something that people could talk about. And, you know, we trusted our uncle because he's the one that out of anyone in the world, we would have trusted because we knew that he would have the photos and that it wouldn't get out and leak and all that stuff. And little did we know that the um, other people leaked it anyway, but um, that's what, how we looked at it. It was like, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it now. We're not going to do it in Germany with some photographer. We don't know. We're going to do it, you know, with our uncle who we trust and we know that we're in good hands and, and that's what we did. Can I just tell you something funny? Yeah. I'm a big glam metal hair metal guy from the eighties. <laughs> and that album cover is the least risque thing I've ever seen. Isn't it crazy? <laughs> it, 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 that's, I mean, thing. like, it's like, it's, but that's, you know, it's like they, they, they take something small and they make it so big in terms of like they they want the they over exaggerate it to the point where it's like folklore. But I know and, and especially for like magazine or, or you know, I mean this is at a time when Janet had that cover with, you know, with her um husband Renee where the, the hands were over her I mean that the Rolling Stone Yes, picture. yes, and, yes. And so the was, Rolling Stone picture. Yeah. Yep. You know, so I'm like, you know, we were just like it's like, you know, that's a thing. It's like, but yeah, so it's just like one of those things that is just so frustrating because it's like you know, I don't know. It's just, I think people look at it differently when it comes to Michael Jackson. And it's like, oh, that's proof of this, this, and this. And I just, with Square One, it was so, I mean, that you could see it the way I was talking. It was just so annoying because for me, that's one of the great memories I had because he had, he was filming Stranger in Moscow at that time. And it was a great, you know, I don't have, I have a lot of memories of my uncle, but I don't, have specific memories with my uncle and that was one of my specific memories i have like i could remember you know the the sound stage i can remember everything about it you know and it's like to have someone that doesn't even know him and doesn't even know me try and dirty that experience and pervert it for their own gain that bothers me because they don't know the intentions i know the intentions because i was there right i totally get what you're saying it's it's pretty interesting. So I guess my, my deeper question, once again, it's more for clarification, yeah. um, is you seem to be the patriarch because you're the oldest brother. Is that correct? For the, for three, for the, for three T or yeah, for yeah. the family. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious why T, uh, TJ or, uh, or Tarot, your other brother, Tarot, Tarot, Tarot. Tarot, right. Uh, why they didn't get on square one, I guess. Just once again, this is more just like the more oh, information yeah. or the more people you have staying, obviously the, the more secure your, your argument is or defense. I think just cause I had a relationship with Danny already, I had done something with him and it was, oh, that makes sense. and it was something to be honest, I didn't know how big square one was going to be. I had done so many interviews. And so this was just another interview of doing, and it was almost like, okay, I can fit it in here. Let's, I mean, I hate how I look in square one, <laughs> I, I, you know, in terms of that, the angle and everything. I remember that day and I just like, I would have changed a lot of stuff, but it was just one of many interviews that I was doing. And I yeah. think with my brothers to just, you know, one of the things is if like, even with our family and I, I've had family members come up to me and they're like, you, you're doing such an amazing job. 
And it's like, so it's like, I think sometimes when there's too many people saying stuff, it clouds, it, it, it clouds everything in terms of, you know, that way. And my brother TJ has gone on, you know, when he was doing his music and stuff like that, he's gone on plenty of, of things and talked about my uncle um, and, you know, how frustrating it is about the media and stuff like that. And, and Terrell's more private in that way. He won't do that. Um, but he, I mean, he will, if he's asked, you know, but he won't just volunteer to go on an interview or something like that. And it's just, it, that's the reason there was no other reason. It's just, I was in the kind of the groove of being interviewed. And so they were like, okay, you got it. Yeah. I think you make a really good point too, about it being centralized. If, if it's coming through one solitary voice of the family, that's good. Yeah. Um, how, how have you been handling that pressure? I mean, have you been doing this for the, since 93? <laughs> um, or since whatever, 80 or something, yeah. or, you know, real quick with the, my brothers, we did do a interview in France together. Um, we weren't in France, but we did an interview for France about leaving Neverland. And so, you know, when the opportunity does arise, rise, you know, that's, we do do interviews together. It's just, that was it. Square one was kind of, you know, qu a quick one in that way, but yeah, I mean, I, me and my brothers, it's funny, you know, because my uncle was always around, we always would tell him because we always saw the lies that he had to deal with. And we saw how it affected him. And we always told him, we're like, we'll be your soldiers. Like, we'll be the person, you know, you don't, because he, he took it to heart, you know, yeah. even though his person, you know, the persona that many people saw was like, oh, I got rhinoceros skin and, you know, it doesn't bother me. It did bother him. He's, he was a sensitive person. And it, you know, especially when people were lying about him. And so since the beginning, we were always like, we'll be your generals. We're going to be the ones that, um, that, you know, we're not going to let you just go into this battle alone. And one of the things I did was, you know, when then, as you said, when the, I went the 93 allegations hit, we were the first ones there, you know, out of everyone to um, just cause we were able to um, be there for him. And um, same thing with the 2005, I, I left, you know, my apartment and moved to Neverland because I wanted to be there every day for him because I knew this was going to be very hard for him. And I was there every day of that trial and before the trial in terms of because I wanted him to know that he had support. And, um, and then, you know, one of the things is, is that what do you give the person that ha has everything, you know? Well, when he's no longer around, you know, you can defend him and you can stand up for him. And that's what I did because and I feel honored to do that because I feel like I'm finally giving back to him. He gave me everything, you know, without question. And now I can give something back to him in that way. So I feel honored doing this. Yes, it's been a nightmare. Yes, it's been the hardest thing. I bit my tongue thousands of times where it's bleeding. I have a daughter that um, was um, basically born like two, two months before square, uh, leaving Neverland came out. And, um, I had to make that decision. What do I do? Do I just, do I be selfish and, you know, raise my daughter and just let, let's, uh, leaving Neverland take its course or do I stand up for my uncle? And, um, it didn't take long for me to just see my daughter and you know, look into her eyes and go, I'm not going to let her grow up in a world that thinks Michael Jackson's a child molester. It's, it, it ends here. And that's why I do it. I do it for her. I do it. I, I see her and I'm like, I'm not going to let her live in this, in a world that thinks this way because it's not true. And so that keeps me going, but I do miss out on a lot of things from her, but it's a sacrifice. How do you take care of yourself emotionally and spiritually and to make sure you're not I don't even know how to say no, it. I, I know what you mean. Um, okay. Um, it's it's called unplugging at times. I mean, uh, one tweet on Twitter can ruin your day, you know, especially if it's very ignorant and that, and I've had to kind of step away or just like, you could read 30 supportive tweets and one really nasty one, and it could really ruin your mood. Um, so you have to kind of unplug. You have to take, take a step back. Um, I'm, doing a project, you know, a, um, a project for my uncle right now where I have to study pedophilia in a way, you know, in terms of like cases and all that stuff. And it's like, it's, you mentioned it earlier. It's such a dirty feeling 
that I literally have to watch like four comedies or whatever and space it out so that I don't, you know, cause it's such, it's so dirty and so, you know, dark in a way. And, 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 and you were, and you were a victim as well. So yeah, it can well. drudge up all those same feelings, emotions that, you know, you went through, but I don't want to be naive either, you know, and I was you know, in that way. And so I've studied those, you know, whether it was the, um, the Olympic scandal or, you know, um, it's like that, those kind of things or, or Epstein or, you know, or, um, there's certain things that I've studied now because I've had to study in, in, in a way. And one of the things that's always is interesting is that, you know, Michael didn't have, there was a, a lot of stuff that Michael didn't have that they pretend that he had in terms of, he didn't have, he had power with the fans. He didn't have power with the industry, with the media, you know, which is what, we're seeing with these other people, they were very, they hid in plain sight because either people protected them or, you know, or people basically, you know, the higher ups kind of were in cahoots with them in certain cases. That wasn't Michael's case at all in that way. Right. And what's interesting about that too is um, to your point is the Weinstein, right? We're seeing Hollywood being exposed now. Yes. And it's very easy to take a single unique individual who kind of is on the fringe, but made themselves, right? The mm-hmm. size that they were and just everyone point their guns at them Especially, to deflect from themselves. Deflect from, I always say, you know, people say where there's smoke, there's fire. I go, no, you know, where there's smoke, there's mirrors. And that's basically how I look at Hollywood right now is that basically that's good. Michael was the smoke. Like they basically, yeah, I mean, we saw it clear as day with Harvey. It's like, Wherever Harvey's name started coming up, here comes a Michael Jackson story in that way. I mean, Square One, I Square One, sorry, Leaving Neverland debuted the same at the same Sundance as Harvey's, um, Harvey Weinstein's documentary. You even hear about Harvey Weinstein's documentary. Mm -mm. Um, I didn't even know there was one. It aired, and and Harvey's was out. I mean, Harvey's was out first and scheduled first, but then it's like here comes Michael Jackson's documentary, and it sucks up all the air so, to the point where no one even talked about. I think it's untouchable that no one even talked about that documentary, and that's the thing. That's that's how they play that game. In that not thread. only that, but also the uh, U.S. premiere on HBO happened like the first week of his trial. I believe. Yep. Yes, it did. And they put, they kept pushing it that that's the thing. The timing like is like the, they wouldn't give a date of when the premiere was going to happen until they knew kind of when Harvey's trial was going to happen. So it's like, it's all strategic in a way you see it. You want to, you know, take once you, as I say, it's kind of like the matrix. Once you see it, you can't unsee it, you know, but it is to other people. They're like, Oh, come on, you know, or that's just coincidence. But there's there's enough coincidences to now be like okay that's just how it was especially when you realize that Harvey did pay people to deflect. Yeah, it's crazy because Chris and I, we are we are the guys who see the strings attached to the puppet. We see the man behind the curtain. Mm. We we can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah. We've always been advocates for uh, just truth. And 100%. look, I mean, it's so much bigger how. This Michael Jackson incident, this whole thing is showing how others are being are are using things and manipulating the world to their benefit. And now they're being Mm -hmm. exposed. So it's even bigger than Michael. I mean, as big as this story is, it's the entire industry uh, being exposed for who they are. And and they should be in that way. And that's the thing. Um, But they're even to the point they're still being protected in a way. The story should be a lot bigger than it is. And, you know, Corey Feldman's been on this case talking about this since you know the early 90s and no one took him serious and he's been very consistent about certain things of hollywood you know um but they already had their sights set on michael jackson and that's all that they cared about in a way and even in Corey's book Corey says michael was my protector michael's the one that you know that kept me away from that stuff and and you know in that in terms of the view like he was his, his escape from all that stuff and it's like i always find that in- interesting because it's like that's how he was with me as well he was my escape out of that you know world he almost wanted to make sure i was okay and that i would grow up quote unquote normal because i had that bad childhood um, right and Corey also is yeah. a self-proclaimed victim of 
of sexual oh, yeah. abuse. Oh, child yeah. Sex abuse. So exactly. we're finding that. And then obviously Macaulay Calkin's story yep. mm-hmm. and, and how, you know, how he describes the bedroom. I mean, what's really interesting is like we hear bedroom, I hear four walls, you know, you might have a bathroom attached, but that's about it. You know, this, the sizes, it's like a wing. I don't yeah. even know why you call it a bedroom to begin it, with. I mean, yeah, it's, his, his bedroom would be something that people would dream would be their house in a way, you know? And, and, and um, I just think it's interesting because the word bedroom, you know, it, it already sounds sensual and same thing with the word bed, you know, and that's something to, yeah. to me and to, you know, I know with my uncle in general, this is a piece of furniture like if if I would have said the same thing, like, oh, we, we watched movies and then fell asleep on the couch, no one would have thought anything. But it's like, oh, we watched movies and fell asleep in the bed. It's like, oh, whoa, whoa wait, what? You know, and that's just, it's wording. It literally is wording and it's just circumstance. But that's how we're conditioned because we see bed as one, a thing for one thing only. And that's not what, you know, that's not only what a bed is used for. It can be exactly. used to actually sit and watch movies and stuff, which is what we did. We'd watch Three Stooges or whatever, pop popcorn and throw it at the TV. And it was just, fun. it was fun times and it was never sinister. It was, trust me, I was looking through a different lens at that time, you know, in general. If I would have seen any, like going back in my 30 years of, you know, and going, okay, let's rewind. Let's see if anything in my brain could say that was weird or that was uncomfortable, or I saw how he did that with this person. And and that's not right. I've not one time thought that because, and I've rewind plenty of times because he didn't think like that in that way. And as many people want to try and make it sound like he did, it wasn't what he thought. Yeah, it's totally crazy. Like I said, it's like when you hear bedroom, to your point, you just hear room, bedroom. That's where all the magic happens, right? Yeah. All the stuff. We went to the bedroom. And yeah. it's like, it's it's almost like you're a victim of a bad word choice. It's like, don't call it a bedroom. Just call it like a wing of the house yeah. or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, but that's the thing. And especially with my uncle, it's like he didn't, you know, he was so on the run and he, he didn't sleep much at all anyway. So it was like, the, it was just a room to him in that way he was always somewhere else and it just i don't know it, it's hard for me because i just i know the scenario and i know i'm putting on two hats i know what the public kind of i'm not in a bubble i know what that right. sounds like and i yeah. so i can understand certain people's point of view you know oh well i would never let my kid blah 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 blah. i understand that but you know, also didn't have the experience that my mom had where my mom did allow that you know, because my mom knew my uncle's heart, just like, you know, um, if you know someone well enough and you trust them, then it's like, I would, I'm going to give an analogy. I hope it's a good one or whatever. But if, if you have a friend that's gay and, um, and in terms of like a, a gay guy or whatever, and, and, um, and he has, a, he has a, a, a female friend, it's like, they can sleep in the same bed and, and be fine with it because they know, you know, the gay guy's not interested in her and she's not. Interested yeah. There's in no, him. there's no funny business. Going exactly. On. And she's not interested in him. So people would hear that and go, Oh, we went to Vegas and we shared the bed and all that. People wouldn't be like, Oh, well that's right. Or even two women like girlfriend. I was yeah, out with my exactly. girlfriend. I've, I've, I've used that excuse too, but you know, um, I was sharing um, a bed and I'll say it and I'll explain. Cause I'm going to have to explain. I was sharing be- bed with my best friend on one of my tours because I was too cheap to buy another room because it would cut into my, bu- to my budget and my, you know, so he slept on one side and then, you know, and I was, you know, his feet were in my face and I was, you know, in the other. And then I had to change rooms. Cause I was like, you know how this looks, you know, people might assume because we're two guys that something's happening, but he's just literally my best friend. And, you know, right. and I don't want to pay for an extra room, but it's just like, that's just society. That's just how people think. And, yeah. um, and so it's just, it's just frustrating that people sometimes don't see past certain things. They just like, Oh, well, I wouldn't do it that way. So it's guilty. Right. Mm-hmm. I know exactly what you mean. Oh, go ahead, Jess. Oh, no, it's just agreeing with you guys. <laughs> so going further down through um, the the conversation, the, the negotiating of the 20 million to the three three hundred fifty thousand dollar scripts to down to one. Was that all like recorded or how how did that conversation go? Is that all in documents that Danny provided in square one? So um, in square one, uh, Danny did play part of an audio clip that see, 
these conversations were recorded between Anthony Pelicano, which was Michael's private investigator, and Barry Rothman, who was Evan Chandler's lawyer. And um, Pelicano was having press conferences where he would play these clips for the public to, you know, report on. Of course, that kind of disappeared because I'm sure you don't remember that hearing about that when this was going. I on. don't. No, not yeah. at all. But um, that clip came from like archive news footage that Anthony Pelicano was playing. So. Anthony Pelicano, he did go to, he's out now, but he went to prison for wiretapping. So I'm assuming he recorded a lot of conversations, but yeah. That would, um, that would probably constitute wiretapping for oh, sure. Oh yeah. So I mean, it kind of check, kind of checks out. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah and, and so, um, you know, as I was saying way, way, way back in, in, in this, um, I grew up kind of watching people try to extort my uncle, you know, in general in that way. It was, it was a part of life. And that's what was frustrating was I don't think my uncle with this heart of hearts thought that this would get any traction just because of who he was and because of how much he cared for children and, go, and going to orphanages. I thought he thought the public would be, would see through it. And it just, it was the perfect storm because it happened, as I said, with, you know, when Current Affair and Hard Copy were at, at their biggest, you know, in terms of they were getting big numbers. And, right. And they were paying people yes. to interview. So it, it and, was. And to make up stories. And, and yeah. So, I mean, and, I would have made up a story if I had known, I would have said something. I'm sure I could have used the money. And so <laughs> it, 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 it basically shocked him in a way. He's like, how could these people believe this? Look what, you know, I've done so much. You know, and why are these people believing this? And he was at, and people forget he was out of town on tour at the time. So he was getting the news of what was going on in America from other people in general, too, that some of them didn't even want to tell him how bad it was. Some of them, you know, were panicking and telling him how bad it was. So right. imagine that push pull, too. He's on stage and everyone there just screaming his name. Right. And then he gets to the he gets to the hotel room to unwind and everyone's shitting on him. Basically, and and I saw that push pull. I'm I'm going to talk about it in my project, but basically, I can tell you a little about that. It do, it destroyed him. It literally he stopped eating. Um, you know, um, he had to be fed. Uh, what's it called? Intravenously. Intravenously. Uh, yeah, yeah, intravenously. Yeah, he had no appetite because he he couldn't think straight and he couldn't eat. And there were times on tour that literally me and my brothers would prop him up on stage right before he did his um, right before he went on because he got a certain energy from the fans and, and it was like, he needed to re-energize, but he was like, it, the image still haunts me because I feel like part of me feels like, was that the right thing to do? But then I know that the fans gave him that love and energy and he needed that, you know, I almost feel like I, I feel guilty for propping him up on a stage when he's like, you know, when he physically couldn't really even stand at times. But then once that audience hit, he would liven up and then yeah, he, he, turned, he like turned on like a switch, turn on like a switch. And then he yeah. would, he would be walking back to the van and then he would just like either collapse or, you know, and it was like, it was like deja vu in that way that that's what happened. And I always thought I was doing a good thing because it was like he was giving, showing him his love, the love that the people had. But I can't imagine what he was going through. And that's kind of what my project is, is kind of like, OK, all these stories, how did it affect him? Because he's human and, you know, he was a private person and we've never heard really the stories of like how the rumors of this or the rumors of that or whatever, how he had to deal with that and the people around him, what they say in that way. And so um, that's kind of the unique scenario that I had that, you know, is kind of a continuation of square one in that way. But it's like, it was just devastating to be there. And that's why people like Elizabeth Taylor that were there as well. Um, you know, she was, from what I've heard, she was one of the people that was, um, that had convinced him to settle. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I have to be cautious because I didn't hear it, hear it. So I'm just saying I, from what I've heard. Right. And, and we can say allegedly, you know, we're, yeah. we're covering our bases. We're not here to slander anyone. No, no, sure. no. I love, first of all, she's, she was the most amazing person. I, I can't imagine. I mean, like she was, she went to bat for my uncle, you know, and I even think if she was alive today, this wouldn't have happened because she would have shut down all of Hollywood and put them in their place. Um, but I know what she thought. She thought it's only money, you know, 
you you're on tour, you, you have a career ahead of you. You just got, I think you got a ridiculous publishing agreement, you know, for X, I think it was like 60 million or maybe it was $70 million. So she's like, you have the whole, your whole life ahead of you. You know, why would, you know, why would you get bogged down in this? Make it go away in that way. And then we saw with the criminal slash civil case in terms of which one was going to go first, that really put his back against the wall because then it wasn't even a choice anymore. It was yeah. Kind and of- I wanted, I was really curious about that. Uh, how the heck did the verdict on the criminal case preceding the civil case get lost uh, or whatever? The argument by Larry Feldman um, allegedly is that Jordan Chandler was too young and his memory might be like fuzzy after some time. So that's why he was pushing for the civil case to go first. And right. he wasn't helping the, he was letting the cops do their job. So he wasn't like, oh, I got this info. Here you go, cops. They were doing their own thing. And the cops were doing their criminal investigation and coming up empty handed. So where I'm like, I'm just going to keep doing this. And, you know, uh, it really came down to uh, Jordan Chandler not wanting to testify. But uh, yeah, there was that would have been like the only cooperative evidence was his testimony in a criminal case, which he didn't want to do then, or even as an adult later on in the Arvizo trial, which he also had the opportunity to do, but he vehemently fought. Yeah. He didn't want to. And I think that also the settlement in the settlement, it, it never prevented anyone from that family from testifying. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things that always bother me is they make it sound like it's hush money. Well, if you, if they're still allowed to testify in a criminal case, then where's the hush money? You know, that's a great point. And I'll, I'll be honest, whenever I see a, something settle it, the, the first knee jerk reaction, of course, without looking at is what are they hiding? Right. I mean, exactly. let's be honest, we go that way. It's unfortunate the way we look at the world like that, but that's kind of where we go. Well, I, but, yeah, I was going to say, I also think that, you know, in terms of corporations would do that all the time, whether it was McDonald's with like, you know, like the coffee being too hot and someone spilled, you know, and they had a lawsuit and they would just settle it out of court. Michael was the first artist or figure that basically became the poster child of why you don't do that because you're now you're considered guilty in that way. And I think a lot of people learn from that, but he didn't really have someone ahead of him to go, okay, that's going to look really bad if I settle. You know? Right. And, and to your point, his hand was forced at this point because the civil trial was going forward regardless of the criminal part. Correct. And, and he made sure with the, with the settlement to say that it was negligence, you know, and, 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 you know, that he, there was no wrongdoing and he presumes or that he declares his innocence. He put all this stuff in that made him probably feel like, okay, I'm putting this in so that people know that I'm innocent, but it didn't matter because the media just took it and ran with what they wanted to say anyway. Right. Well, it's like uh, when you get a speeding ticket, when you sign it, you're actually not signing an admission of guilt. You're signing that you got the ticket. Yes, exactly. Right. So it's like, but you're going to sign it. So you're like, oh, you must have been speeding. Well, yeah. no, I just signed acknowledgement of the ticket. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to uh, bring up is uh, that Michael's team went to court four times to try to get the criminal case pushed first. So, I mean, why would it? Which I would have done as well. Right? right. Obviously. Yeah. Anyway. And so, but the reason why the judge sided with the Chandlers is because of Larry Feldman's argument that Jordan was too young and his memory might become fuzzy. Yeah. And what I love about, I mean, once again, out of this tragedy or out of this smear campaign comes good things, right? You know, we've got an exposure of truth and now civil cases cannot go forward unless the criminal case is completely, aren't there laws now in place that yeah. almost because it's almost like a Michael Jackson law. Yeah, no, there was it, a lot. So that's after great. After. Yeah, it's great for them. You know, I mean, right. For, it's uh, a great I, result, right? Yeah, An outcome out of this tragedy. Exactly. And, and and that's the thing. I mean, I think, you know, it's just hard because, yeah, the civil case, if that was allowed to go first, it would have been the equivalent of like, you know, a championship game from, of, a, of a team and they get to watch the other team practice and, and see all the plays. You right. know, that's literally what it would have been. And so that's why, um, just, you know, mentioned that the lawyers, you know, went four times to kind of get the criminal case ahead of it. So almost like, no, let's play the big game first. 
you know, because I don't want them to see all the plays. And 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 that's kind of what um, is happening with the Johnny Depp Amber Heard thing right now. She took notes, basically, you know, from this ca- the case that they're going through. She was there every day taking notes because she has another case coming up. So now she knows how what exactly what Johnny's going to say, what their lawyers are going to say. So she can adjust and she can kind of fill in the blanks of certain things. So in a way, it's it's very similar in that aspect of it. And that's the way I kind of look at it. It's like, okay, now I see what that means. Yeah, that's and, that's crazy. Oh, go ahead, Jess. On another note, as far as um, having like fair juries and stuff like that for a court system, the DA was really after Michael Jackson. Taj, did you ever hear about Tom Sneddon, the Michael? Oh, yeah. <laughs> did I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't say much about in terms of he was, you know, I mean, he was after him. It was almost like it was beyond a vendetta. It was like a personal grudge in a way. And um, it's it, it like out for blood, like almost like this is going to make my career. So I am going to get this guy. That was a mm-hmm. big question of mine, too, especially with this is. With all the eyes on it, I mean, one of the things that prosecutors criminally need is is persecution, right? They need to have the verdict in their favor because they have metrics that matter. It seems like the criminal case was pretty – it was decided pretty quickly, right? The verdict was came in pretty quickly? It was like two weeks. Two weeks, and obviously not guilty on all 14 counts, right? Correct. So it, it's curious why they would have pushed forward seeing that – the, the outcome was so different than what they went in for, you know, um, it makes them look bad. I mean, it makes them look bad that you lost on all four. You got 14 counts. I think and, arrogance, you know. arrogance, and maybe um, overconfidence in the media and pushing the narrative in that way. I mean, they were controlling the press conferences. They were, you know, they, if they could paint Michael to be this weird, you know, outsider kind of guy, you know, then maybe they could get, I mean, I don't think they ant- they anticipated maybe getting the public on their side, but I don't think they anticipated how good Tom Mesereau was in terms of talking to that jury and them seeing Michael as, quote unquote, a human, you know, which is what they did. They got to see Michael as a human and, and actually see, no, this guy that I'm looking at right now is not the guy that they're trying to make me think he is. Right. right. Like they were trying to dehumanize him in a way and yeah yeah which which is which is their whole tactic yeah that's always been their tactic and i mean with everything like they it's almost like not only larger than life but just like he's more like a cartoon character so and people still to this day like don't have problems saying bad things about him because it's like they're like oh it's not going to hurt anyone and but it's like he has kids he has a mother he has brothers he has a sister I mean, sisters, he has, you know, family, it does hurt people, you know, but they don't see it that way. Because it's almost like he's such a big, you know, figure in that way. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. So um, going through that some more, um, November 12th, 1995, something about Jordan Chandler emancipating from his parents. Mm. Do you guys have any more insight on that? It was just kind of brushed over in the documentary, but I was really curious if you guys had any more information on that. Uh, I'm looking right now. I have my arsenal, I call it. Up <laughs> Excellent. Right now. Jess, do you yeah, know and- that was before the, the, um, a, like what, of the father fight with him that, cause they got in a, a, a altercation. Was that there before? was an altercation between Evan Chandler and David Schwartz. I believe it was summer of 96. Yeah, uh, I got the file here. It's July 22nd, 1996, Evan Chandler versus David in June. Um, sorry, I should have. Uh, read no, that's okay. I I kind of I kind of jumped in, but but basically to help help Taj uh, to your point, it was something about Evan beat up Jordan. Yeah, right. There's, there's, and there's, and yeah. I was curious why there oh. were there ever criminal charges also against Evan, or was it just the emancipation, or how to how that all kind of came together. So you're talking about Evan and Jordan, and that happened yes, in correct. 2005, um, right around the trial, let's see, uh, on July 7th, 2005. So this was after the verdict. Um, yeah, it was a complaint. Yeah, it was a improper behavior, harassment, improper uh, making communications. There, there was a restraining order 
Um, okay. The restraining order that was filed. But it wasn't the case. it wasn't the criminal charges, right? Because there was an actual physical assault. Yeah. Didn't he hit him with something? I, yeah, I, I thought there was like it was like a baseball bat or something like that. But I I, I read that in a paper of something, so it's not yeah. something that I I. I yeah. I, yeah, but in square one, they also talked about the emancipation mm-hmm. of Jordan Chandler, right? But that was ten years prior, nineteen ninety five. Okay. Correct. I'm just curious. Is that? I mean, does that kind of play into the whole story of how his parents and and Jordan were not really on the same page? Well, I mean, I mean Jordan's never publicly spoken, so I, you know, I'm not going to speak on his behalf. But June, his mother, did testify in that trial, and she had said, and she testified two thousand five. She hadn't spoken to her son in 11 years. So that would have put 1994 right around the time of the settlement. So, wow. I mean, it's the whole situation is sad for yeah. Jordan. Yeah, it, it's it's sad for Jordan. And, and um, I truly believe that, like, he he got put in a situation. And, yeah, I mean, for you to get emancipated from your parents just shows it, it, it kind of speaks, you know, volumes in my in my, you know, especially the timing of that. Yeah, I have the file here with the assault. It says the judge found that plaintiff had proved that he and his father, the defendant, were members of the same household when defendant struck him on the head from behind with a 12 and one half pound weight and then sprayed his eyes with mace or pepper spray and tried to choke him. Jeez. Uh, So no bat. It was like a dumbbell or a barbell. Are you kidding me? This is unbelievable. But that's that's the stuff that I mean, you you went down that rabbit hole and kind of dug that up. But most people don't even know that you know, in that way. And, and that's, you know, that's right. Because the character of the parents, I mean, the parents are the ones suing on behest of the child, of the child who doesn't seem to be, you know, voluntarily cooperating Mm -hmm. uh, and and all this stuff. It just, it just adds more cloud or more shadow to this, you know, to, to what people are saying to the narrative of Michael Jackson is this person, you know? Yeah. And I think there's, there's this, um, there's this conversation that I want to, you know, about the 1993, I call it the extort, extortion case as opposed to the, you know, settlement. But um, Chandler says, you know, Michael, uh, the career will be over. And then uh, Swartz, which is, you know, says, does that help Jordy? And then Chandler says, this is Evan Chandler, um, says Michael's career will be over. And Swartz goes, and does that help Jordy? And Chandler goes, it's irrelevant to me. Yeah. And that was, and that was, recorded on audio yeah we that was definitely in the in the documentary and that just that turned my stomach that your father's using you and not even i don't know however not even caring about you know i mean when my mom didn't tell my dad about my abuse and as jess said because my dad would have killed him you know literally i know my dad and i know he found out when i publicly announced it um and I know why my mom didn't tell my dad because my dad would have probably went down there and the guy wouldn't be a lot, wouldn't have been alive for much longer because that's what, you know, the anger and the, what the parent would have done. I've seen my dad want to fight. Um, what's it called? Um, the, I guess people that sell, you know, fake merchandise, you know, on our tour. Oh yeah. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, Scott, you know, the, the, um, he literally uh, in, in your unlicensed, he, like the unlicensed yeah. stuff, right. The, the yeah. t-shirts and he, he wanted to go down and fight the guys and, and our security is like, you don't want to fight them. They're gangsters, you know? And my dad's like, I don't care. They're ripping off my sons. And, and so that's my dad. And so right. that, if he's willing to do that for some t-shirts, well, he's like the true head of your household, right? He's yeah. like a protector. Yeah. If he's willing to do that for some stupid 3T t-shirts that are, you know, then I can't imagine what he would have done if he found out. Oh, wow. I just, um, sorry to go back on to the uh, emancipation thing, but I just found the file uh, written to Jordan from his uh, legal team and it's dated June 13th, 1995, 10 years to the date before Michael's exoneration. But it says, Dear Jordi, we have received your, a copy of the petition, petition for emancipation, which we propose to file. But I could send this guys to you guys. Wow. Can you just give us like two sentences of why he wanted to do that? Since I it doesn't okay, it doesn't say okay. It says that even though juvenile court files are confidential, that in my opinion is insufficient to protect you against a claim that you have breached the agreement in the underlying case. It's a bunch of like legal stuff, but okay. there's no specific reason given. Charlie Brown's mom. Okay. 
Gotcha. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, is there anything else, Chris, that you had about Square One or any other questions? Um, or yeah. do you guys have anything? Oh, Chris my last stuff, question so. is: um, objectively speaking, but I would like you guys to both answer this. How do you guys see the future of Square One? I mean, what do you in the coming months, years? What do you hope it's going to do? What do you think it's going to do? How do you see this all playing out? Do you want to go um, first, Jess? I think that after this podcast, it's done <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I, we just really hope it's all grassroots and then he did such an amazing job. I just really hope it gets out to more and more people. So I know it's opened the door for other projects and yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm very proud of Square One. I, you know, I was just interviewed. A lot of people think I have more to do with it. I've helped promote it because I stand behind it. But, um, you know, I didn't help fund it at all. I didn't do anything, didn't do any of the heavy lifting of anything. Just went to the premiere and loved it. And, you know, I'm a big supporter of it. But one of the things I can tell you is that it's changed a lot of people's minds um, just because it's a story that people haven't heard because the media hasn't been fair enough to tell that side of the story. So a lot of stuff sounds new. It shouldn't sound new because it's been there since 93, you know, if you, if, if you knew where to look, but it is new. And, and, and Danny and his team did such a great job of putting it in, in such a way that it's under, it's easy to understand and easy to digest to the point where you get it, you understand it. And, you know, it's like, it should leave you angry at the end, like, oh my gosh, I was duped, or I, I can't believe that I thought this way. And, you know, the best thing for me would be, be as, um, would be the people that used to rock Michael Jackson, but don't, didn't feel good to rock, like one of you guys said in terms of, it felt dirty, but now you've seen square one and you realize, okay, I was wrong and I'm rocking them more than ever now. And I think that's the thing, the power of square one in that way, because it not only just, you know, it's, it presents the facts and it allows you to go and, and look them up and research them in a way. And it's kind of like the, gets you into that rabbit hole quicker. My last question is, can you tell us about your next project, Taj? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, and it's interesting. It's, it's kind of been evolving because look, I would like nothing more to not have to do a project because, you know, Michael, people have seen, you know, the truth. And now all of a sudden everyone is like, oh, Michael's innocent. You know, it's, it's happening, but it's happening pretty slowly. Square One's been a huge leap in that way. And one of the things that I've always had to do is evolve in terms of like, okay, what does this project need to be? Because I knew Square One was in the pipeline. I knew other things are in the pop um, pipeline. And I don't want to rehash a lot of the same stuff unless it's needed to. And so for me, my project has always been in terms of, okay, who was Michael Jackson? Because that is something that a lot of people forgot or a lot of people just didn't know in general. And there's a whole generation of people that grew up that don't know him at all, just know the tabloids and the headlines. And so I truly believe once you get to know who Michael Jackson was and what he stood for, you'll realize that these, this case, these cases, and in terms of, you know, the, the allegation, they really don't have a leg to stand on once you realize. And so my whole job is to get the people that were closest to him, his friends, his coworkers, you know, his family, and basically not kind of speak for him in a way, you know, cause he's not here to speak for himself. And so if it was a eulogy, it would be something similar to that, but it's not going to shy away from, you know, the, the controversies because, you know, his life was filled with controversies. And I think that actually shaped him, whether it was good or bad or, you know, the, the 2005 case is the reason he's still, he's not around anymore. Yeah, I think that case literally destroyed him. Um, I don't think he was, it almost set him up for, for it. I have to be careful how I say this, but it wasn't for me. It was a, it was a matter of, well, how long does he have? Because it just like, it destroyed his soul. It destroyed his spirit. 
you know? And that was one of my questions was um, uh, coming out of that, right? Like, did that break him? Did that start the substance abuse of, I don't know, you have his fentanyl or some kind of opioid, obviously increasing and leading to his not waking up one morning. Yeah. Well, he's, he's always had a hard time sleeping because he's, you know, part of, and I'm not a genius. So when I say part of being a genius, it's not me, but you know, when I've studied, but you know, because their brain works so fast and they have millions of things going on, they don't sleep. Like they, they want to get to everything. And, and that's always been the case with my uncle in that way. And, and with this is it, you know, it was like, besides the pressure of having to deliver, you know, he's, it was 50 shows, you know, um, at the O2, which was had never been done. And it like, it, I mean, it was just such a ridiculous record that he did. It was almost like it put everyone, you know, wondering is Michael, does Michael Jackson still have it? It put them to shame basically, because right. um, I think Prince had sold Jess, you might know this, like, I think 20 concerts. I, I knew it was less than 50. It's all I know. Yeah, it was and, like, but, it was like yeah. 20 something concerts at the O2. And it's just like, and Prince is huge and Prince is one of my idols. And so it just, I think one of the things is, yeah, my uncle was never the same. And, and I want to show that like, because he's human and you, the certain things like the Pepsi commercial that burnt his scalp, you know, third degree burns on his scalp. He was never the same after that. That was the height of his career. And he gets these burns that he had to live with. I mean, they literally stapled his scalp to back together. Well, your he, dad was there for that. He oh saw yeah. That. And, and, and I lived with my uncle's pain. Like every once in a while he would make this sound and, and he'd say my scalp. And that didn't stop, you know, five years later, 10 years later, that was through his whole life. He was still having that pain. So he was always on pain medication for that anyway. So it was like, what if that Pepsi commercial never would have happened? You know, would he have been introduced to pain medication? So it's like, there's so many things, you know, or, or his accident that he had, you know, on tour where I forgot which song it was, where the, the thing that he, that the lifter Earth song. Yeah, the lifter thing drops down, you know, and and hurts his back. It's like there's certain things that contribute to, you know, it wasn't like he's like, oh, I like how these drugs feel in terms of this pain medicine medication. Let me just take them. It's like that and the constant bullying. It's like, you know, it's interesting because people are sympathetic when it's not Michael Jackson. If you heard that story from someone else and they were constantly bullied and made fun of and, you know, they were taking pen pain medication and numb the world around them, you'd be like, oh, that's very sad. You know, I can't believe these people did that to him. But when yeah. it's Michael Jackson, it's like, oh, he's a druggie, you know? He, he yeah, like what does he have to be uh, feeling bad about? Yeah, right? yeah, he overdosed, yeah. you know? And I hated that word overdose because, you know, the doctor- It was a homicide. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, he was, you know- Yeah, well, it was, it was a, it, was, it stopped breathing. So it's yeah. just, it was not a good situation for sure. Well, one misconception is that he was just like, completely addicted to drugs after the trial. And that's not completely true. Like doing the research, I found that he actually put himself through rehab, yeah. um, like 2006 or I'm, uh, no, I, th I think it was, two th it was before he passed away, but he was not trying to keep pursuing that. I just, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. He wasn't just like, yeah. Yeah. And I, I hope, I hope I wasn't accusing that. Oh, no, you weren't. You weren't. That line no. of questioning. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but, but I can see, you know, your spirit's broken and I, I come from addiction and I'm familiar, you know, the addiction is the effect, not the cause. Yeah. A lot of time, you know, to your point, obviously pain medication from a traumatic physical experience in the Pepsi commercial. I, and I recall that. And I remember the lift with his back. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm just talking about the spirit being oh, yeah. almost shattered when the world is looking at you as this criminal and you're still, you know, you're top of the world still. It's, yeah. well, it's that push pull that we kind of talked about earlier, but, but Taj, to your point, I'm really curious about your project. Is it, is it just going to be much more personal? It, it, it is, but it's also, you know, it's going to go through the controversies because, you know, I'm not going to skate through those anyway you know if i skate through them then people will be like oh he's just trying to hide something i think what i would love is for this for my project to be something and it's a multi um, episode project it's because i can't get it all in one episode or two episodes um is 20 30 40 years down the line someone picks this up and they realize who michael jackson was 
and what his life was because it's almost like the tabloids have had their the tabloids and the mainstream media have had their chance to tell their Michael story, but that's not who Michael was. And everyone that knows him knows that. And, but he was such a private person and he didn't believe in, you know, in going on TV and defending himself. I mean, he had to at certain times, but he, he tried to look past it. And that was one of, I don't want to say his faults, but that was one of the things that that's why we don't have so much on him defending himself in certain ways was because he just kind of thought it would blow over. And, and yeah. also he, in some places he couldn't like with the Chandler settlement, they were not allowed to speak about it. Yeah. And when he finally did say something, I think it was Diane Sawyer, they sued him, you know, mm-hmm. when he said he was innocent, they sued him. Yeah. From, you know, right. so it's like, you, you know, but people don't understand that or know that. And so there's a lot to uncover. And especially as someone like me, that's been literally there from, you know, his star on the Hollywood, you know, walk of fame. I was right there in those pictures right next to him with my brothers, you know, to on the set of Moonwalker, on the set of Captain EO, you know, I've witnessed it all. I've seen it all in that way. And he was the most amazing person. And of course people are gonna say, oh, well, he's your uncle, but I'm talking about people that he wasn't related to in a way like workers and, you know, makeup artists and stuff like that will tell you the exact same thing. You know, if you talk to Karen Faye, she'll tell you the exact same thing. You talk to Karen, Carol Lemire, they'll, she'll say the exact same thing. But, but it's like, but, but they can agree on one thing. Michael was amazing and Michael didn't, would never have done that. And that's what tells me, you know, all these people that, you know, can't agree on one thing, but they can agree on, you know, Mike, um, on Michael Jackson. And that's how I always look at it. I've never, ever thought, okay what about this or what about that? I've, I've looked at it through the lens of someone that had been abused before. And I can tell you, my uncle was one of those rare people that just, he really cared about children. And there's that, it's um, that one speech that he says, um, I think he's half like it's, it's a slurry speech. Um, And um, I forgot who recorded him without him knowing. Murray. Was it Murray that recorded him? Yeah. And it's like, you could tell he's half out of it. And he's talking about- Can you tell us who Murray is real quick, just for Murray's clarification? The guy, yeah, go, you want to say it, Jess? Um, he's the person who is charged with uh, murdering Michael Jackson, like yeah. legally. Yeah. He, he was the doctor. Oh, the do- he's the doctor? Okay. He was the doctor yeah. that was supposed to administer the right amount and whatever. And then, you know, um, Murray basically records my uncle without him knowing and, and my uncle's like half out of it, you know, um, and he, my uncle in that time is talking about building the biggest children hospital and that's one of his goals in life to help the kids and to build this hospital. And I just thought that was so amazing. Like, you know, I think when you're, you're like half out of it, you know, it's like, or when you're drunk or any of those things, when mm-hmm. like inhibitions are gone, you tell the truth a lot, you know, yeah. in that way. And that's, and, and that was what my uncle wanted to do when he, you know, with all his inhibitions gone and whatever, he wanted to, to help kids and build a, a children's hospital for them. You know, and I'm and I'm talking about I, the biggest one in the world. So it's like that's how he was. He was like that. He visit orphanages, you know, and, and hospitals. You know, no press there. Just you know, and he, as he said, he would visit more hospitals and orphanages than he did concerts. You know, he would he would secretly either donate you know money to for liver transplants or or he would you know he would be on it and make sure a kid had a liver transplant or this or that and. You know, one of the things for Square One when we were doing promotion in, in Holland, I got to meet um, someone that basically her life was saved by my uncle. And it was it, it brought me to tears because I've always known how generous he was and how much he cared and stuff like that. But, you know, just her story and just, you know, just he just was like that. He, you know, whether it was Dave, Dave, which, you know, a lot of people don't know is his his dad um there's a custody battle and between his dad and his mom and his dad poured gasoline on him and lit him on fire and so he had mm-hmm. he had severe burns you know and my uncle saw the story and befriended Dave Dave throughout his whole life Dave 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 spoke at the memorial or the the private memorial not the public one um and it was just amazing cuz my uncle always made sure Dave Dave was taken care of he always 
you know, made him feel special. He said, you're not weird, you're special. And Dave Dave always felt special because he had Michael Jackson as a friend. And I always just, Ryan White, same thing when Ryan White had, um, was diagnosed with HIV and AIDS, you know, his, his own school would not let him participate because they didn't know, you know, this was when AIDS was. Right. You know, HIV think, was so new and scary and just unknown, right? Yeah. And so what my uncle does is he invests his own money to basically find out about AIDS and he brings Ryan to his house and lets Ryan, you know, swim in the pool and everything to feel normal, you know, in that way and hang out with him. That's so magnanimous. It's such a great story. You know, and, 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 and it is, and, and his mother um, tells it so well, Janine, you know, um, I hope to have her, her be interviewed for my project, but it's like, those are the kind of stories, you know, and, and bought him, you know, his car that he, he, you know, I guess it was a car that he was dreaming of having and my uncle saw it and bought, and bought it for him. And it's just like, you know, those are things that my uncle did not have to do. And they make it seem with square uh, with leaving Neverland that he's he was grooming every kid that he met, and that's beyond. He just was generous. He just cared about people, and you know he paid for my high school, my college, and whatever. And I, so I get really irritated with the word grooming. I know that happens with a lot of cases, but my uncle was just generous, and there's a different. And they they, yeah. they made it seem like his grooming was dirty. In well, if they can pin, if they can if they can pin the atrocities of a child abuser to him, right. If they can pin oh, yeah. those, those allegations, then they can say that what he was doing was grooming. Of course, he, he was, you know, and he was hiding, right. Oh, well he's donating to, to ho- children hospitals. Cause he's hiding the fact yeah. that he's a blah, blah, blah. And it's, these are crazy. And no, and I've heard them all. I've heard them all in interviews of, of people saying that in, in that way, oh, of course he did that because he wanted to do this or that, you know, and I've heard them pad the numbers because you know, the average child molester, you know, when given the opportunity that has hundreds of victims, you know, and so they try and throw in all these people just because they need victims, you know, but the, the fact of the matter is all these kids that, you know, from the Macaulay Culkins to the Corey Feldman to the Johnny Spences have adamantly defended Michael, even, Mm -hmm. even to the point where in, um, in 93, 94, when police, we're going up to the kids and their families lying, saying we have pictures of Michael with kids when we need you to help us bring them down in that way. That's what they were telling these ki- people. They weren't saying, well, we suspect they were making it sound like he was this monster. Right. And, they were like implying it. So implying they were already it putting it in, in these people's heads. And, and, and to a testament of, of the families, they were like, well, that's not Michael. No, I'm not doing that because that's not true. And all that stuff because they knew him and they knew his true heart. And, you know, Corey Feldman says it. Johnny Spence says, you know, that's what they did in terms of, you know, they they, they were after him. You know, they secretly tapped his phones. I can't tell you how many conversations I had were with him that I would hear a click on the other line. And it was like we knew what that that meant. And it's just like it was just it's torture. I mean, off and on 10 years, FBI, you know, secretly investigating him two raids at his house and they will not find one single shred shred of evidence. I mean, at some point facts do matter in that. Yeah. That's what I heard. I heard something about that facts being a (laughs) a good thing. It's like, so, (laughs) you know, the description didn't match, you know, which they will lie. And Maureen Orth will said in her vanity fair thing that the descriptions matched. They did not match because if they matched, Michael Jackson would have been sent to jail right away. That would have been enough proof in 93 to you know to get to put him in jail well just on it on its head right wasn't one they said he was circumcised and he's not correct or or just that alone regarding the vitiligo (laughs) stuff not even talking about the skin coloration or anything that's a very different look oh we as guys we know that look is different you know and that's a thing and 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 that that and i i say that you know his death vindicate him of a lot of things vitiligo being one being you know uncircumcised being another you know because a lot of stuff was because he didn't talk about it and say i'm uncircumcised a lot of that was like we knew it but we you know i always knew about his vitiligo i saw it all the time but the public didn't know but it wasn't a public record in that 
And so, uh, you know, his death, you know, vindicated him of a lot of stuff in terms of, you know, the, the, the inaccurate descriptions. Um, one other thing I wanted to tie in again, um, as far as why the perception is that he's guilty by the majority of public. I'm hoping that's shifting sooner than later. It is. Uh, versus what the criminal case found is, look, again, criminally, nothing. There's nothing there. However, Tom Sneddon was like in cahoots. There was one um, press conference he gave and had, he was asked a question. He's like, oh, I don't know. Just ask Diane, referring to Diane Diamond. Yeah. So he, he was in cahoots with the media. So that Did kind of does, go ahead. No, Rob, Rob Zone and, and, and who was um, one of the head prosecutors, he was going out to dinner with the media and, mm-hmm. and like Stacey Brown. And, and it's like, so the, it's like they were using the media to their advantage in that way. And it was just, yeah, I mean, we saw it clear as day, but a lot of the public does it. So it, it was like a gang up. It was almost like a, you know, an um, assassination attempt on his legacy, which in part of the way they succeeded because they wounded him enough that he never fully recovered. And on that note, I was listening, it was um, in a podcast, telephone stories where there was a journalist that was saying that, he thinks that the prosecution won. Uh, did they win in, in the criminal sense? No, but they got rid of the problem because he left. I thought that was the most cold thing I've ever heard in my life. But mm-hmm. if that's what they wanted, that's that's what the journalist was saying, that that's what the prosecution wanted. They wanted him to go. Yeah. Which that just sad. sounds like a just a total team up. I mean, yeah. Yeah. how do you win against that? Well, that's the thing. And I think that's the hard thing that my uncle had to deal with is that, you know, my uncle knowing that what 93 did to him in terms of the settlement and knowing, okay, this time I'm going to fight it. My, you know, they, they made it sound like he could, he was like the way the media made it sound in the 2005 trial was he was going to flee. He's going to flee the country. He's going to flee the my uncle um, flew in to get arrested basically you know, to, to go through the court system and Santa Barbara, no, Santa Inez, um, the court, um, it's, it's a very, um, conservative town in a way, you know, and I think there's only one, um, black, um, juror as an alternate that was on, Mm -hmm. it was, you know, so it was predominantly white. So, and that doesn't sound like a jury of your peers, does it? No, it doesn't. And I think, and that's, what's so amazing about it is that, he, you know, it was almost like he won in the worst scenario you could possibly win. And it's like, no, we're not going to win, you know, and have questions of like, oh, no, this juror voted for, or, you know, voted for acquittal because they're black or this or that. It's like, no, you know, I'm going to win the right way. And, and they did. And, you know, the reason that Tom Mesro at one point was even contemplating not even doing a defense was because the prosecution did such a horrible job because they didn't have anything to work with. There was nothing, you know, they had, you know, they had scam artists as the accusers that were known scam artists to people like Jade Leno, who took, who um, kept his distance away from them because he didn't trust them to, you know, to Chris Tucker, same thing. So it's like, but for some reason, you know, when it comes to Michael Jackson, the bar is so much lower. And that's what we're realizing with James and Wade is that it doesn't matter if they've lied. 3000 times, you know, there people are going to do mental gymnastics to protect them. Yeah. And I found that interesting. The Chris Tucker thing, he was always talking about how generous Michael was. Oh, and I didn't know about that relationship until square one that kind of shone a light on that as well. My, Michael was the type of person that would go, would be driving and he would see someone like a homeless person and he would just grab a wad of bills and, and give it to him, you know, that, and, and not even ask for anything, like not just, just miraculously and then drive off. That's how he was. It was not, there's so much goals and so much that I want to be like him in terms of, because he was just, and it sounds like I'm just a fluff piece, but he was really that amazing that anyone that he knew will tell you the same thing. Like, you know, he just, he was that person. It wasn't like an act. It wasn't like he got in the car and he's like, Oh geez, you know, he was that person. And that's, And you become a target sometimes when you're that person because, you know, you're a good person in a bad world. And sometimes people look at you through bad lenses and they can't see the goodness. 
Yeah, or they they assume ulterior motives for the goodness, right? To hide the exactly. bad, right? How can someone give something to someone without wanting something back? Like, right? How a, dare they? Yeah, there has to be something. Else. You mean that he just bought this kid a car? You know, Ryan White a car and didn't want anything else? You know, how dare humanity? How how yeah. dare you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you've got this project, Taj, and do you have a couple episodes already recorded or do you have it already lined up with everything or are you still in the works? Well, the, to be completely, completely honest and frank, the, the coronavirus thing really kind of hurt it because I don't want to do Skype interviews. I don't want to do Zoom interviews. I wanted to be. I would agree with you. And one so, in person. Exactly. And, and one of the other things is that, um, when I started this project, um, Leaving Neverland was still fresh, and a lot of people that I would have approached probably would have been scared to touch it because it was so um, new, and it was almost like everyone that was standing up for Michael was getting slammed, you know, in a way like, how dare you, you're a sympathizer towards this, blah, blah, blah. And so now the tide is starting to change with things like Square One and just people realizing the truth and all that stuff. So it's a different environment now to approach certain people so there's a lot of people that are now have come to me saying i want to be part of this and there's a lot of people ahead of time that did that anyway a lot of people that i didn't expect to do that um but now i even have more support and i kind of um i'm actually really excited because at the end of the day it's going you know i expect probably about 80 interviews any you know um which is completely different than, you know, leaving Neverland that just had two families, you know, and um, cause I feel like you really need to get to know who Michael Jackson truly was from all different walks of life, from the people that worked for him, the people that, even the people that fi he fired, <laughs> there's this one lady <laughs> um, that I am, you know, that will, um, wants to be interviewed that he fired for, um, and I won't say the reason why he fired her, but he fired her, but she's... We're not going to dox her, Taj, don't worry. But I'd love <laughs> no. to hear this story. So there's a woman that he fired. That he fired that I loved at Neverland, like literally loved, like she was like everything in terms of, to me, like, and, and, um, but she, and she ended up testifying in 2005 um, for him as well in, in that way, because, you know, um, it just, she... If you know Michael Jackson, you know Michael Jackson. And, and if you care anything about justice and hate injustice, you know, you'll speak out. And that's what we've seen with it. I mean, they even try to twist, you know, Marlon Brando into saying that Marlon Brando, you know, there's some stupid story about Marlon Brando until Miko Brando had to go out of, you know, like, you know, out of, I don't want to say hiding. He just was not publicly in the public. And he's like, that story is so false, blah, blah, blah. And, and I knew it was false anyway, because I knew how much my uncle and, and uh, Marlon Brando were friends in that way. You know, when Marlon Brando was sick, he stayed at Neverland. And, um, and a lot of people don't know that, but it's just like, that's the kind of thing. Like my uncle cared about people. And the only thing that really frustrates me about all this is that I wish that during his trial, yes, there were the Brandos and the Elizabeth Taylors, but for all that he had done for people, like certain, certain people, he did not get the same support back for what he had done for them in that way. And that was because certain agents or publicists told their clients to stay away from him in that way. And, and that hurt him more than anything. We talk about the media hurting him in terms of for the trial, but imagine if your friends stopped talking to you or your friends, you know, won't return your phone calls. Yeah. It's a, it's fickle when you think it's, when it's true, when you've made a true reach to make a friendship or you the way did, yeah. and to them, it wasn't the same depth that you offered them. Exactly. And so well, it's kind of funny. We're, we're actually laughing here because, uh, and we, we did decide to do a video just in case we, you know, we wanted to make sure we got this recorded. I have a painting of Marlon Brando in my office, uh, next to Muhammad Ali. So they're, they're both uh -huh. on the video. So when you mentioned Brando, Chris just tapped me on the shoulder. He just pointed over our head cause he's looking over us. He's I watching over it. us right now. I love it. And, and I think that's the thing. I mean, you know, it's funny, the old, old Hollywood, like the Gregory Pecks and the Marlon Brando's and the Elizabeth Taylor's, you know, they understood my uncle. They knew his heart. They were super friends with him in that way. It was, it was the younger Hollywood that, you know, 
was so worried about their career and their, I mean, we see it today, you know, it's, it's kind of like no one will take a stand against anything, you know, cause they're so scared of what, you know, what it's going to do for their career. So they have no backbone about anything. Yeah. Well, the cancel culture is just running rampant oh, right now. Beyond um, rampant. It's, it's well, almost like you, you put a target on your back willingly. If you say, yeah, anything. I mean, we started our podcast and we actually have two very different podcast themes. For example, one's just a, a screw around, right? It's called beer Googles and we <laughs> get, we get drunk and look up random shit on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> so that one, we make really bad, dirty jokes. Like I, it, we're shameless, but it's the intense humor. It's not to hurt anyone, but we know that coming back around, we're going to get <laughs> called out on some yeah. stuff that we've said. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing, but I just, you know, I just wish more people um, did their research, you know, kind of went down that rabbit hole because, you know, um, I, I, you know, my uncle was amazing, not only as a human being, but just as an artist. And I, I want people to be able to appreciate his music. I think it's very unfair what the Simpsons did, you know, with he's the only episode ever to be taken out of the Simpsons and he still is out of the Simpsons. And I think that's really yeah. and hypocrite. That's unbelievable. You know, I mean, there's a lot of um, guests on the Simpsons that have had allegations that they've admitted to and, um, you know, with underage um, kids, you know, uh, rock legends and stuff like that, that are on the Simpsons. And, I just, it, it, the hypocrisy bothers me more than anything. At least be consistent. You know, if yeah. you're going to do something like that, be consistent. Don't, don't pick and choose. Oh, we care about this person. So we're, we're going to keep this episode in, but this person, you know, we're going to go with the flow. Yeah. I mean, it definitely sounds like the cards are stacked against your favor, regardless of his guilt or innocence, regardless of that. They're, they're definitely leaning on, on him. Well, the, the media, because the media is, For such, sure. is such a big mouthpiece, but they're getting, I think every, you know, year it's less and less because people are finding their news other ways. They're finding the truth other ways. And so what the media used to be, they used to be the one all be all, but now they're not because other people are getting information and they're setting up podcasts or channels and they're delivering it, you know, other ways. And I mean, that's how square one happened was you know, Danny decided, you know, someone that was like, yeah, I like Michael, but, you know, I, you know, I want to talk to his nephew and his niece about it. And, you know, and that interview went so well that he's, he went down that rabbit hole with his team. And, and, you know, I didn't know where that was going to go. I just, when yeah. I did the first, first interview, I just was taking any interview that would take, take us at that time. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's what it, that's what it speaks to is I, I can just tell from the buzz that's on Twitter and in social media how much how much this is growing. And I obviously I'm not telling you what to do, but I it's my opinion that the mainstream media put your put your uncle in this position. Mm -hmm. Screw them. Yeah. Do every podcast interview. Screw that's them. Right. You will yeah. get you will get the exposure you need, but you do not need them anymore. And they're they're scared. They are scared, and and I've realized that I don't need them anymore. And 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 there's cer certain people that have come to me in terms of like, you know, um, like oh, I know someone in Canada that you know the the blah 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 times, and you know this in this um, city they have you know a newspaper, and I th and I know them very well, and we can do a piece and all that stuff. And then they come back. I'm sorry, they don't want to run a pro Michael piece. And I'm like, so they get their hopes up high. And then I'm like, but I already know the answer. <laughs> you know, I'm already right. thinking like, oh, oh, okay, we'll see if that flies. And so I'm not disappointed, you know, but they are because they thought, oh, well, we have all this evidence and why wouldn't they want to talk to you? But you'd be surprised. I mean, look at Good Morning America. Yeah. It seems like the um, the media, if I try to look at this from an objective or strategic viewpoint, from the 50,000 foot level, which I hate that expression, um, the media plays on the masses and the masses love when the mighty fall. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. like I, I'm a golf person and, but I'm not a Tiger Woods fan because mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't get into golf until about five or six years ago and I love golf, but I'm a horrible golfer, but I still like it. And that, which is really mm -hmm. stupid and illogical. So, but everyone loves Tiger Woods because he was amazing and then he fell off the radar because a bunch of chicks fell out of a tree. 
Um, and now they love him again. But I still remember on Thanksgiving night when his ex-wife took a nine iron to his Escalade. Yeah. But I'm the only one that remembers that. Yeah. So that's – and then, of course, everybody went crazy with OJ. Yeah. So it seemed – my point to this rambling is um, – the media caters to the masses who love that. But to your point, Taj, they don't think about the fact that this hurts people mm -hmm. personally, like personally hurts you and your emotional well-being and your family and everyone around you because they want money because they want ratings to get money mm -hmm. is basically what they're doing. And that's, that's freaking shameful. Yeah, that they're using our family for ratings and stuff like that. And, and you know, part of that, we know that. Like, that's why we know we're going on. And, I mean, there were certain channels that we go on and they didn't want Brandy because she's not a name. They wanted, you know, my Uncle Marlon because he's part of the – it's like, but Brandy dated Wade. It's like, oh, no, no, we want Marlon because he's the name, you know, and all that stuff. And so that's how the game is played in that way. And then certain people in the media – particularly didn't want brandy because they didn't want that to destroy the narrative and um so it's just like it's frustrating when you know you have a piece of the puzzle that it's like is a counter and and i say that only because i've seen the media plenty of times but oh well here's the ex of so-and-so or here's the girlfriend of so-and-so they do that all the time of like wanting to get that person on but somehow when it comes to our family and it's like she can provide a different viewpoint you know it's like oh no no we don't want her you know, because she's pro Michael, right? It, Shameful again. I mean, it, it's we we grew up, honestly we grew up with it. I mean, you know, even with my career as three T, I mean, the first reviews of our album, you know, before we hit, were horrible. And when I say horrible, like you know, what a disgrace to this family. Da 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 da. I mean, they'd said everything they could, gave us the worst reviews, but then we hit like you know the top of the charts. Um, and all of a sudden now the same album that they dogged, it's now every single is an A, you know, when they gave our album an F and it's like, you know, because now they need us and now they want, you know, want us to be friends with them in that way. And I've seen, it's just hypocrisy, but I've seen that that's how it works. And, and I'm not only talking about Hollywood, I'm talking about, you know, this happened in the UK as well. Yeah, well, we talk. I mean, let's look at BAFTA, right? Yeah. Jess, do you want to talk about BAFTA and what oh, happened oh, oh. there? And then we can shit on that for a bit before we move on. Oh, yeah. I thought it was like hilarious. I'm like, are they trolling Leaving Neverland? Because the award, it wasn't best documentary, it was like most factual documentary. It kind of reminds me of like when Trump goes on his rambles. It's like, is the greatest, most factual documentary that's ever existed? You know, just rambling. That was the best Trump impression I've ever oh heard my entire my life. Hold on. Goodness. Hold on. We have, we wow. have something for that. Hold oh, on. my God. <laughs> Wait for Hold it. On. Wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> that was the best <laughs> Trump impression I have ever heard. Please and why didn't me, we start the show why with that? Why you have orange makeup on and an amazing wig, right? For sure. Sure. Uh, I didn't know yeah. the talent, Jess. <laughs> That was amazing. So please continue. But can you can you share what happened at BAFTA before I just jump it? Because I don't even think Chris knows what I'm talking about right now. They I don't. Won the most factual documentary award. I knew that part. I, I think that's it. Um, I don't get what people. Yeah. Get so leaving. Upset. Yeah, leaving Neverland won the most factual series or some something, right? Yeah, most something factual like documentary. That. Yeah, I was like, are they trolling? This is hilarious. and that was two weeks ago. Yeah, like, yeah. Right? That's a joke. That literally, is a, especially with all the. Um, with the, the secretive editing that Dan um, Reed did, basically, as we were, you know, discovering all the lies, he was taking it out for the UK version. So it's just like, it it's so um, dishonest in a way. But I, at the same time, I I know the game. I grew up in the game. I, I would grow. I grew up watching the Grammys and the American Music Awards, and like, hey, Michael, can you show up to this? We'll, we'll give you this award if you if you show up because of the ratings and this and that. So it's always been a game. It's always been rigged in that way, you know. And it just it it leaves a bad taste in my mouth because it it shows you that they're trying to push an agenda, just like the Emmys did, you know, because they HBO was a huge sponsor of the Emmys, and you know the Emmys. One of the things that was very dishonest was the Rotten Tomatoes review. You know, it had a great score with the critics, but they wouldn't allow the audience score 
to people to put reviews in the audience score. And so, um, and, and I called them out on it because someone brought that to my attention and they only released the audience scores um, once all the, basically the voting was over for the Emmys. So if you were an Emmy voter and you didn't even see Leaving Neverland, if you went to Rotten Tomatoes to see how it was, you would see like a 98% and go, oh, okay, well, this is a good, this must be a good documentary. But right. now if you go on Rotten Tomatoes, you'll see 98% and you'll see audience score, you know, I think it's at like, it's like 14%. 24? Or, I don't know, it's pretty we, can, we can probably pull it up right now. Yeah. We've got this interwebs thing I heard about. <laughs> but um, what's really interesting about that too, Taj, to point that out, it was very similar. If you're familiar with Dave Chappelle, it's, his it's last exactly special, that. it's exactly he got like fifteen percent or something yeah. or or zero, yeah. and then they did the audience. It was ninety nine percent. It's it was the exact flip of that, and that told me everything I needed to know is that when the media has an agenda, they will they will get on point. And they will yeah. they will sell it and and they will not break rank, you know, but the audience really dictates. And that's why I think the threat of them not letting the audience score go until the votes were cast, because they knew once the vote that that would manipulate people in terms of like actually trying to look at it from a different point of view. And I just think that was just so dishonest. And why I say that is because Rotten Tomatoes is r related to HBO with Warner Media. You know, Warner Media owns a part of Rotten Tomatoes, so it's all, you know, it's not just random. It's something that's like, hey, you know, it's just if you follow the trails, like you guys said that you you do all the time, it you see you see it clear as day in terms of how they're manipulating this or that, and um, it's frustrating. But you know, more and more people are waking up to it. More and more people see it, and more people see the scam, and they're not being sold on it anymore. I think that just goes to show with everything. I mean, with music, movies, TV, every entertainment type is being – and this – I sound like a total idiot. It's being controlled from ab above and yeah. by who I have no idea. And and it's just – yeah, it's, it's disturbing. Yeah. And I know that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But no, it it's, does, though. It's it a – it's a it, it really I, I I feel very uncomfortable with that concept because I before we started today, I you know, I've been doing some research, et cetera, and I looked up who owns HBO and then you just said it sixteen seconds ago, like Warner. But I didn't know they had a connection with Rotten Tomatoes and HBO. I had no idea about that. Yeah. Like, oh my god, my eyeballs just popped out of my head. Like, oh my God, of course they're connected. Yeah. Why wouldn't they be? Like oh. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's like it's 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 like th those up on top they're controlling the food that we eat. Mm. And so by controlling the food that we eat, they control our health in that way. And that's the thing like our mind is our health and so they're controlling how we think and you know they're dictating it. it's like oh, you're going to get this and you're going to get that. We're giving you this now and you're not going to see this. And and it's unfortunate and I really, you know, Hollywood has a bad problem with pedophilia, you know, in that way. And it's amazing that it's still not as like you would think that the media would be all on it and would be, you know, really adamant because th these are children, you know, we're talking about. This would be something that everyone should be in agreement with. You know, but uh, can we see Dan Schneider yeah, and uh, what, uh, what's the other guy? The kid, uh, Drake Bell, right? Dan Schneider, Drake Bell. Drake Bell's Dan Schneider's protege. Dan Schneider was on that head of the class show as Dennis, whatever, the chubby dude. He's a producer, right? And now all these allegations are coming out, what he's done, or at well, least the allegations have, of what have happened, right? Yeah. What, but Mark and Chris, what have you heard at all about Corey Feldman's documentary that came out months ago? Anything? I didn't know there was one. See? Wow. Exactly. And wow. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know there was an Epstein one either. I didn't so, know that there was one. See, wow. But see, I also, but, I'm the kind of person that, I, you know, like I don't watch the news. I don't. Like I don't have cable TV, so I, I don't. I just I don't get on the internet except like to check the Dodgers score. So you know I don't. I don't say I don't think my head's in the sand, but I don't. I stay away from mainstream media because it's just crap. It's, it's, Were you aware it's, of Leaving Neverland though? 
Well, yeah, because I have HBO. I, I had HBO. Oh, they plugged that. No, I, I will say so, we got, I got sucked into that. I'm happy to admit. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, it and exactly it was right. out for a while before I finally was like, all right, I'll freaking watch it. So I didn't, I, maybe Mark told me to watch it. I don't remember. I did. Pro- it's me. probably Mark's fault. I'll just blame him. <laughs> Hashtag Mark's fault. So. <laughs> Well, you you guys you guys listened to that reaction that I had from it. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. not gonna lie that I was so disgusted after hearing it. So real quick, I'm gonna say it. I said it for the first oh time in God, like three podcasts. Quick. I said real quick. Yes. Okay. Uh, I pulled up the Rotten Tomato score. Mm-hmm. So the audience me. I'm sorry. Let me do the critic or the tomato meter for Leaving Neverland is 98 percent, mm-hmm. and the audience score is 24 percent. Yeah. Meanwhile, I jump on square one. There is no tomato meter available. Oh, what a shock. <laughs> wow. Yet yet the audience score is 97%. Yep. So there's, but there's one there you reviewer. go. There's one tomato reviewer. Yeah. Oh, oh is there? Film threat. Yeah. Film threat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just saying it says tomato meter not available on my yeah, yeah. Um, website. Probably because there's not sufficient enough um, amounts. But yeah, and sh- shout out to Film Threat for. Um, or they're hiding it. Yeah. That's very true. We're yeah. suppressing it. Look, we get shadow banned too. I mean, the shadow banning is a real thing. It's, it's you know, the, but that should tell people something. You know, it's like one of those things. It's like they don't want you to know certain, you know, other side of something in that way. And if, if they were truly honest, they'd be like, okay, well, see both sides and then make your decision. But they don't want that in that way. And, I, you know, I've had to see, you know, you know all these – movies the disgusting movies you know the epstein one and i said the olympic one um with the olympic gymnastic you know um athlete a mm, with larry nassar yep yeah that one i've seen open the open an open secret i've seen Corey feldman's you know documentary my truth can you can you talk about that one uh cory feldman obviously i hadn't heard of it so please advertise it propose you know uh share it with our audience we'd love to hear these places to go or these well, he's, documentaries to watch sure he's basically explained about him and cory Haim, um and you know how there's hollywood has a, a big problem with pedophilia and how he wasn't protected in hollywood at all and a lot of people know this and know about the you know what's going on but is hiding it and um, what's the name of it again um i think it's called my my, my truth my truth and where can we find it um he's still st- um mytruthdoc.com yeah okay mytruthdoc.com we'll we'll uh we'll post a link to it as well and if there's any links you guys want us to put we'll put them on the show notes yeah. as well and I, I i think that's amazing because you know people have accused Corey of wanting fame and fortune and all that stuff and he's been consistent since i as i said before 93 you know when he told the cops you know who had done this to him and, and everything like that. And and they didn't even go after the people because they were so, you know, driven on Michael that they basically like, okay, okay, well, if, if it's not Michael Jackson, we're not interested. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, but why I say that is because the easiest thing for Corey Feldman to do, if he really cared about fame and fortune was been like, Michael touched me too. That's all he would have to say. And he would be, you know, back in the spotlight and given all this. Oh yeah. I think they'd embrace him. Everything, you know, and, and sell his story and blah, blah, blah. But that's why I, you know, I've always given Corey Feldman, you know, um, a lot of credit because he's easily had that opportunity plenty of times. People have even implied that to him in Mm -hmm. ways. And he's been consistent, consistent for the last, you know, 17, you know, what heck, 20, I don't know. My math is off. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, yeah, since 93, you know, that's what I get for trying to do math, you know, in my head while I'm talking. But yeah, I think that's the thing that I would say is that, you know, the easiest thing right now to do, which is, you know, would be for other people to pile on. That's what they're expecting with this Michael Jackson. And that's what Wade and James expected. They were hoping that more people would just, you know, loosen their morals and be like, you, you know, okay, I'm going to get onto this money train now too. But they underestimated that, you know, not everyone is like them. Not everyone is that shallow in, in, in that way. And it's actually backfired because everyone they've approached has basically given them the middle finger and said, go away. You know, Michael's not like that. 
Yeah, and, it's. I pretty mean, wasn't there supposed to be like dozens of victims that were going to come forward after leaving Neverland? Where is one? Well, Where's one? Well, that's <laughs> that's what their lawyer said, and you know, in Radar Online, line too, he said there were, you know, there's, you know, twenty, there's twenty something victims, and he paid two hundred million dollars, you know, mm-hmm. for all these, and which is a fabrication, but it went everywhere, you know, because they don't have to prove anything. But it's like, right. you know, then at the end of the day, it's like, okay, well, I'm waiting. You know, and and yeah. that's and where's the one? Where's well, this the one? is the thing. I think they were waiting for the BAFTA award for most factual documentary series <laughs> before they move forward with their <laughs> other cases. <laughs> I mean, come on, this is like such a joke. Well, oh, I'm uh, just yeah. I'm just sitting here laughing. I mean, no. this is laughable right now. Well, uh, one thing the lawyer their lawyer had was I, I don't even think people remember this. There was a Jane Doe attached to Wade and James. Oh, that's right. You know, mm-hmm. and once Leaving Neverland, you know, was announced, she disappeared. Because she mm-hmm. didn't, she didn't fit the narrative, so wow, yeah. that's she's unbelievable. She's not even mentioned in Leaving Neverland. No, she's not even mentioned. So there was a female, but because it doesn't fit their narrative in Leaving Neverland, she just disappeared. So I find that truly amazing, and you know, it's like well, that's a crazy thing, thing, right? It's like like it's it's funny because documentaries now have an agenda going in. Oh yeah, yeah. and All it's of like them that's do. not even that's does. well, they do right because it's really ultimately the the evidence supports the claim that. He's innocent, right? Yeah. That's where Square One's agenda is. But, you know, it would be nice for just to say, I have a topic I want to look at. Let me just gather all the in- information, throw it together, mm-hmm. and then, like, not come up with a conclusion. And let you right. make the conclusion. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. That's what but, I think Danny did it a really good job in that way because, like, I think he did. ends with Stephanie saying he was a pedophile, where leaving everyone, it gives the channelers the last word, you know? Yeah. And he never says, therefore, he's innocent. Yeah. It's up to the viewer to decide. And I love the way Danny did that. Yeah. And, I, and to and on Danny's point, I mean, we'd love, we, we have an open invitation for Danny if you guys ever want to come on. And, you know, Taj, when you have your project or want to launch it again, we'd love to have you back on to promote it however you like. Jess, you're more than welcome at any time for, you know, any for subject Trump if there's something you want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think we're going to have to record some Trump impressions <laughs> and we will use them. We'll put them on our little sound pad for sure. Okay. That's, and you were going to say something, Taj. I'm oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was going to say that's one of the reasons I call it my, my project as opposed to a documentary is because I do believe like in today's world, documentaries are biased, you know, they, and especially coming from a family member of course it's going to be called biased and so i'm not even gonna you know i'm not even gonna pretend to be you know oh i i'm gonna get both sides i'm just gonna present the facts i'm gonna present the story and but i know it's gonna be called biased anyway so that's why i've stayed away from the word documentary because i'm still old school where i think documentary should be you know kind of like here's the it's presented to you and then you kind of come up with your own conclusion and so that's not how it works now. So I don't feel comfortable calling it a documentary. So that's why I call it a project. Well, and I think that's a great, st- Oh, go ahead, Jess. I was, you get kind of stuck um, being labeled as pro Michael Jackson because mm-hmm. the truth is pro Michael Jackson. Yeah. So you can't yeah. just say, Oh, it's factual, but I mean, it, that's just how it is. Like the truth is on his side. It's pro. So I'm sorry, but that's just how it is. The evidence and the facts are, and right. And that's the thing in, in, um, you know, the, the slogan facts don't lie. People do. That was something that was, you know, said in the um, press statement to um, the media that our family released. Um, you know, one of the quotes that I um, made and it's taken off, but it's been, it's, it actually is very relevant to, you know, the situation in general. It's like, there's, you know, for the amount of, of time Michael Jackson lived for someone that was probably one of the most photographed and recorded people in history, one of the most famous people in history. And, you know, in terms of staff and, and um, people that work for him or friends and all that stuff. And it's like, there's not one shred of evidence, you know, an FBI, you know, FBI on and off investigating for 10 years, you know, illegals, I'm not illegal search, but, um, um, the surprise, surprise search, um, you know, um, ser- uh, raids, I will call it in Neverland, taking his computers, his six computers and not find one shred of evidence. You know, it's like at some point you have to go, OK, you know, it, it, 
at some point, you know, he's not a pedophile because, you know, they've they've done this with Epstein. They've done this. Even the the, the guy from Glee, when they took his computer, he had oh, child, God, yeah. he had all this child porn on it. It's like, well, look at Jared from Subway. Exactly. And, you know. and, 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 you know, when the FBI um, zeroes in on you, they can find stuff really quickly. Whether they do something or not with it is another thing, but they find it very quickly. And they released all their paperwork on Michael Jackson. There was no evidence in and that's the thing. They're very efficient. And that bothers me because it wasn't like my uncle knew they were investigating him. He had no right. clue. And so it's like they were following his every move at times, trying to find something. And it's just like at some point you have to go, okay, there's logic involved in this. Do I believe these two guys that, you know, at one point said Michael was innocent? One, one of them wanted to get married at Neverland, you know, with his um, his fiance during the trial in 2005, you know, and, it's, you know, the place that he supposedly got abused hundreds of times. Right. You know, yeah, because that's going to erase that memory. It's not going to imprint yeah. <laughs> it more, you know, and, and, is, and is doing tribute shows for him. And and the other guy, he also did something at Neverland. Um, He did um, a I think it was a video or something. He went back to Neverland and did a video. This is pre leaving Neverland. So he revisited Neverland. Then he makes up a story about, you know, train station that doesn't even exist for years later. And he, he's rambling all these places like the movie theater and the swimming pool. I can tell you the jacuzzi and the swimming pool is, was one of the most, you could see that place from 360 degrees. Anyone that walked around the, the, the Neverland could see it. And, so, so the there was no, right? there was nothing hidden. There was no, no secret. No, spot. like for, for the, and, but he, but he, they rely on people's, I shouldn't say ignorance, but ignorance of Neverland. Like you wouldn't know that. Right. They don't know the blueprint yeah. or the layout. You're thinking, oh, well, that's a private jacuzzi. That has to be our private pool. No, that was an open pool. And at the minimum, my uncle had at Neverland at a time would probably be 30 people there. That was like me. every once in a while I have to do this, Taj. I have to do. It. I go, hello to the world. Do you realize that Neverland was more like a resort than just like a house? <laughs> yeah, and like they, they make it seem like he like he had the key to the gate, and it's like okay, let's go in and they're like turn on the lights and all that stuff. No, there were people always there. There were people that worked there. My uncle hired former police officers to be a security guard. You know why would you do that if you're a child molester? Like, yeah, uh, it's, I, I mean, oh. the whole thing, the more you pick at, I mean, the more we look at it, obviously there's just inconsistency after inconsistency. I mean, we're, we're almost three hours in. Are there any other thoughts? Oh, any, wow. anything really? else you got? Yeah. It's like a time warp in this place, guys. I'm looking at, I'm looking at 242 <laughs> and I think, I think uh, square one was 89 minutes. So yeah. we're at 162 minutes. We're approaching just, leaving. We're almost Neverland. double. Yeah. Like. We're approaching <laughs> leaving Neverland, which is totally fine by me. I'm really enjoying the conversation. I, you know, if there's anything more personal about you guys, and obviously I think we'll probably have a follow up at some point down the road. Maybe if we can get Danny on and all, you know, the four of us or five of us get on. But are there any other final thoughts that you have, Taj, or anything else you want to share? No. We call it know, a day? As I said before, I just really appreciate the opportunity. You know, I can ramble a lot. I get excited because, you know, every opportunity is a chance for at least me to, you know, share who my uncle truly was and, and you know, let the viewers at least make that educated, like, hey, let's go down this rabbit hole. Let's learn more about him. That's all I ask. I don't ask for anything else, but, you know, just be fair. Like you've heard one side, now hear the other. And square one's a great way of getting to that point. Yeah, that's a really good point. And if I may uh, kind of jump on that back real quick is I remember Amy Winehouse and how she was portrayed in her last mm -hmm. year or two yeah. of her life. She was this drunk diva that didn't care and didn't want to do anything. And then I watched the Amy documentary yep. mm -hmm. and it, and once again, it, it gave me another angle. It, you know, obviously you've got three sides to every story, mm -hmm. got your side, their side and the truth. Right. Yep. But it does shine another light onto the, the struggle and that just the it pain humanized her and, and, and that way. And, and you, then you, there's one effective thing in that where I saw like, there's a bunch of comedians making jokes about her at her worst time. You know? Yeah. And they, and they were the one like Jay Leno made a joke about her a week after she was on his show doing her song yeah. that they made her do rehab over and over and over again. And yeah. she was a struggling artist. I mean, she was troubled and they just piled on. So yeah. I, I can't even imagine the target that Michael had on his back. Yeah. And, you know, being the king of pop. Yeah. Well, so are there any other final thoughts or 
things before we call it a day. Once again, open invitation. If you guys have something you want to share, feel free to reach out to us. You can email us directly and we'll, we'll definitely talk with you some more. No, just, as I said, I'm just super appreciative. And, you know, for, and for, to your audience, you know, thank you for listening to me. Um, Mm -hmm. I ramble, but at the same time, you know, I'm extremely passionate about this and, you can find out all this information online and it's not something that we're making conclusions to or jumping, jumping to conclusions to this is stuff that you can find court documents or, you know, things that are definitely facts in that, as opposed to just like hypotheticals. That's awesome. How about you, Jess? Do you have any final thoughts or anything? Um, I would say, well, since this is going to air on the 28th, um, happy early birthday to Michael Jackson. He would have been 62, I believe. Yes. 58, yeah. he was born. And happy belated birthday to Taj. You yeah. were August 4th, Taj? Yes, I was. No, Yes, I happy, am. <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I actually had to look to see how old I was because I, <laughs> I honestly, I, after like a certain age, after I think 27, I stopped counting. So <laughs> I think I stopped after like 10. Yeah. Just make it easy. Yeah. And Jess... Anything else? Did you have anything um, else you want to? I did have one last question for Todd. It's kind of it's kind of out of the blue, but are you cool if I just go with it? Yeah. Go. Light All right. Monday. Monday. Oh no. Before Tuesday. That was it. Oh, that was it. That was That's it. Question. That's a great That's question. Hard. I mean, I'll tell you really quick about the song. Is you know. That was a song that was supposed to be on his album and he had too many songs. And so we got that song just out of, um, he just gave it to us, but it was only, he only had his backgrounds on it and whatever. And, you know, we've never asked him to do a song with us. We've never asked him to do a duet with us. It's, he's, he just gave it to us. And it was one of the greatest gifts that we could have, you know, I mean, who wouldn't want Michael Jackson on their album? Right. You know. Uh, yeah. So that was Jess's little fun thing. She wanted to just kind of throw <laughs> that. her ball at you. You know how long so I'm going to learn those lyrics, by the way? I mean, because it's those lyrics are very tricky and I still yeah. they have to. And the pace. Yeah. The tempo was off because we were going to do the whole four part of that. Uh-huh. And I just told her, let's just do the first line because there's no way. <laughs> I, love that we, I was would racing home. I was like, Mark, I got to do this. We're going to record in advance, but traffic, you know. I love hey, it. I was able to, I was able to record it. So, yeah. Hey, Hey, so guys, please stay on because uh, what we're going to do is we're going to shoot the outro music and then, but stay on so we can just talk after. Sure. But sure. once again, thank you so much for this special episode of Square One Documentary Insight with Taj Jackson and Jess Garcia. Thank you guys very much. Really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. We're so grateful and uh, we're just going to cut it out and we'll catch you guys later. 